Yo, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I believe in this the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, in the other world, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to ask the CAO if there's been any uh, additions or deletions to today's uh, regular or consent agendas. Yes, we have uh, two corrections, um, Chair Cummings and members of the board. On the regular agenda, item 11, there's additional materials. There's revised memo packet page 46, which is replaced. Onboarding and mentoring section revised. Paragraphs 1 and 2 are also revised. On the consent agenda, item 23, there's additional materials. There's revised attachment C, packet page 245, which is replaced. And paragraph one should read, general road maintenance consisting of vegetation management, surface patching, ditch clearing, cleaning, drainage maintenance is prescribed independent of independent, of independent district boundaries. Uh, that concludes corrections to today's agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any um, board members that would like to remove items from consent to the regular agenda? Seeing none, we'll open up for oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address us on items that are not on the agenda, items that are on our consent agenda, or if you'd like to speak to an item that's on the regular agenda, if you speak now, you will not be able to speak when that item is heard later in this <laughs> meeting. And so I'll turn it to the members of the public, uh, and you'll have two minutes. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. Uh, again, I call your attention to uh, uh, Lenny Mandanka, who's co-chair of the largest lobby west of the Mississippi, of Leon Panetta, who gave policy and military information to the Red Chinese, and that uh, that particular espionage agent. You have two plaques on the courthouse steps, so everybody going up there to receive justice doesn't get it. As Bruce McPherson received thirty thousand dollars from Katrina Lung, front page U.S. News and World Report. Uh, we just had the local Republicans bring in a speaker called Steve Hilton from Fox. He put together a group called a Yellow Journey that allows the red Chinese and foreign governments to buy our land throughout California and throughout the country. Uh, so it's bipartisan treason. The Democrats aren't on this at all alone. And we've got a uh, one person up there, Zach Friend, whose two former employers were registered lobbyists for the Red Chinese. This place stinks. Uh, according to 1313 Charles Miriam, who in his own books praises Mussolini and Hitler, uh, says that the county administrative officer the members of the city managers, in fact, the first founder of the California League of Cities was Mr. Phelan, whose campaign on his front page says, keep California white. He belonged to Bohemian Grove, which sacrifices children in effigy. I urge you to go on the air and TV and see what these wonderful people are all about. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Casey Swink and I'm the Director of Substance Use Disorder Services for the Behavioral Health Division of our Health Services Agency. And I'm here this morning to thank the board for their support of the proclamation for International Overdose Awareness Day, which is August 31st, 2024. And we want to recognize and honor that over 100 people in Santa Cruz County lost their lives to overdose in 2023. And this continues to impact our individuals, families, and the community at large with substance abuse and overdose. I also want to recognize that the Health Services Agency and a variety of community partners work diligently every day to mitigate the harms related to overdose and substance abuse through evidence-based practices such as naloxone distribution, inappropriate settings, harm reduction activities, access to medication-assisted treatment, and residential and outpatient treatment programming, as well as utilizing our opioid settlement funds to align with local, state, and national guidelines. Um, so all that being said, just want to sincerely thank you, Chair Cummings and the rest of the board for your support of this proclamation, as well as your continued support for substance abuse and overdose in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Just following that, morning supervisors. Um, thank you for acknowledging International Overdose um, Awareness Prevention Day on August 31st. 
We know overdose or poisonings have made a devastating impact in our community and nationally. Janice of Santa Cruz was founded in 76, and we are celebrating 48 years this year as the largest provider of, of substance use disorder in Santa Cruz County. This year, Janice will celebrate some major milestones in combating the opioid crisis. February 1st, alongside the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office, this wasn't planned, um, and the County CAO's Office, we reopened the sobering center here across the street to divert first-time DUIs drunken publics and under the influence. We are on track to divert roughly 2,000 individuals, which equates conservatively to 258 hour shifts in savings of officer time. In May, we were awarded the Center of Excellence for the State of California to stand up medication assisted treatment in 30 treatment facilities across California. On September 17th at 1 p.m., we will break ground on a state of the art 25 bed women and children's facility that will serve families in South County. We hope you will join us. And most recently awarded two mobile narcotic treatment programs that will bring medication assisted treatment to the most Southern and Northern regions in our community in early uh, spring of 2025. Thank you supervisors for your support and your proclamation for International Overdose Prevention Awareness Day this coming Saturday and your efforts to combat overdose and poisonings in our community. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors and fellow members of our community. My name is Stacy Palau, and I'm the CEO of New Life Community Services, and we've been serving our community for over 50 years. It was just about a year ago that the board, the County Board of Supervisors acknowledged New Life Community Services Day, issued the proclam proclamation. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings, for that proclamation. And we are also here to acknowledge International Overdose Awareness Day and the impact that it has on the, our community as well. Um, I'd like to thank the government entities, fellow providers, and various organizations with whom we partner in this work of substance use disorder and overdose. We can't do this alone, but together we can. And I also come to you with a request. New Life is supposed to expand our services and we want to do so in the South County as well. Um, we asked the county to consider existing structures or properties that they might be willing to use to partner with New Life Community Services and serving our most needy and vulnerable population of our community. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, Chair Cummings, Board of Supervisors, Diego Palacios. My name is Nathan Salazar, and I'm an environmental health specialist with the Environmental Health Division of the Health Services Agency, as well as an SEIU 521 shop steward. <laughs> I'm here with some of my coworkers today to talk about the challenges we grapple with as we work to protect public health. We inspect restaurants, hazardous materials facilities, drinking water systems, public pools, migrant labor housing, and organized camps, among other facilities. For years, we have had difficulty recruiting and retaining qualified inspectors. Over the last five years alone, 85% of our new hires have been trainees who must go through a long training process to accrue the necessary hours to take a registration exam before they are qualified to conduct inspections on their own. Many of our inspector trainees are working out of class and are responsible for their own districts. Our management within environmental health, including our director, have been supportive of our efforts to improve pay and working conditions for EHSs, and we greatly appreciate them, but they can only do so much. As you know, our union is currently in contract negotiations with the county's bargaining team. We are significantly out of parity from our colleagues in other counties, as you will hear, and we urge you to keep our needs in mind as we work toward an agreement at the bargaining table. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ryan. I'm a environmental health specialist trainee with the land use department. Uh, in land use, we are charged with protecting the public health as well as our natural resources, our groundwater resources for future generations. Our section has six positions for inspectors. I started 14 months ago, and at that time we had one qualified inspector. They retired at the end of last year. The other senior trainee retired short or left the department quit after being certified as an environmental health trainee or specialist. 
<clears throat> Currently, we again have only one certified inspector on our team. Every inspector on our team is currently working out of class. The turnover within our section has been a long-standing issue, largely due to the lack of competitive wages offered by the county in comparison with our surrounding counties, despite the cost of living here surpassing each of them. The result of which has been a cycle of burnout due to a combination of not enough training st trained staff and extreme multitasking. On a daily basis, we deal with counter consults, complaint investigations, permit processing, inspections, emails, and triage with often agitated and hostile members of the community. The current situation is a disservice both to the community we serve and our staff. There's an opportunity to change this ongoing cycle by adjusting our pay to be competitive with the surrounding counties so that it reflects the cost of living here and provide a COLA that is competitive so that people can remain here and live here in this community. Thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask if you could please hold your applause, and spirit hands, what have you, to express your support. But um, if you guys could please hold the applause, appreciate it, thank you. Good morning all. I moved to Santa Cruz about four months ago. I got hired on as a senior environmental health specialist in the consumer protection program here in the health department. And I just had my first performance eval. Thankfully it was all good and I'm allowed to continue on. And I would love to continue on. I like it here, I like my managers, I'm learning a lot. Uh, but as a young guy, I'm facing the very real choice of whether or not the sun sets and liking my managers is enough to get me to say no to a 32% pay raise. In our field, everybody's hiring always at all times, actively recruiting. Uh, myself and a lot of other inspectors I know get offers on LinkedIn, you know, quite often every other month. Now that I'm up here, quite honestly, it wouldn't be much of a stretch to go over the hill, actually to find probably a cheaper living situation over the hill and get that 32% pay raise. Uh, if I decide to stay, it's because I like my situation here. I'm at a point where I'd like to continue learning, and there is a good culture here. There are good managers here. Uh, but that is a hard calculus that I and every trainee that has has to make once we're all trained up and registered. Um, several trainees currently are working out of class due to short staffing. They're out there making decisions that can and will affect the county for years to come. In California, there's a shortage of registered environmental health specialists. A survey of the field by the California Conference of Directors of Environmental Health found that as of April of last year, there were only slightly over 1,700 registered environmental health specialists in the state. The number one reason identified by that study for these people to stay in their work was, unsurprisingly, increased wages. Please consider this in negotiations, along with the fact that your own county study found that we're underpaid in comparison to surrounding counties by 11%. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Troy Boone, a registered environmental health specialist with the HAZMAT section of environmental health. I've been with the county for 22 years. An eight county comparison study shows we're underpaid by 11%, yet our biggest competition for staff is Santa Clara County, which pays up to 32% more. Recently, in our section of five staff positions, we've lost four to either Santa Clara County or private industry in Santa Clara County. One of our positions is still vacant as of February 2023. This on top of also losing our former director and half of the site cleanup team to Santa Clara County. Since 2020, we've also gone through two program managers, and that position has been vacant since the end of 2021. We keep hearing that the county can't afford to keep pace with over the hill, but that is clearly the salary market that we are in. We also uh, are in a crazy housing market, which especially impacts our new staff. We often, lose, we often lose new hires because we're in the highest rental market in the U.S. It's particularly difficult to recruit for hazmat. In addition to becoming an REHS, it takes an extra 6 to 12 months to minimally train and credential a hazmat inspector. So what exactly do we do? We inspect everything from auto shops to high profile research labs, gas stations, bulk fueling facilities and hazardous treatment and hazardous waste storage sites. Also, when an unknown substance threatens to or has been released, we integrate with local fire departments to identify and ensure the proper cleanup and disposal of unknown solids and liquids so they don't harm people, property or the environment. Some of us 
Just two of us also inspect very high hazard ammonia and chlorine storage facilities. Out of those two, only one of us, me, inspects chlorine gas facilities. The ammonia and chlorine gas facilities are located next to neighborhoods, senior centers, schools, and sensitive habitats. So if people such as myself leave because of opportunity, who will be left to ensure the toxic genie is kept in the bottle? Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Alicia Som, and I live in Bonnie Dune. Good to see you up there, Chair Cummings. I've been a registered environmental health specialist for over 18 years, the last quarter being here with Santa Cruz Environmental Health. Thank you all for your time this morning and considering this plight of the Santa Cruz Environmental Health Specialist, EHS. Retention and restructuring for a crucial profession that safeguards the water we drink, food we eat, land we live, and the hazardous materials we use. An EHS must learn to detect public health hazards and secure corrective action through education, voluntary compliance, or legal enforcement. Our advanced scientific working knowledge as health inspectors takes years to obtain. To get there, our trainees must meet state-prescribed education on the job training experience and pass a comprehensive state exam to become registered. The required on-the-job training is a significant investment. Current training data from our program managers is outlined on the sheet that I've, I don't know if it's gotten to you, but it's highlighted here. Um, and uh, 2024 environmental health savings through retention. It's approximately 47 weeks of training per trainee. California requires this training due to the skilled and delicate nature of our work. Since 2018, 11 eight REHSs have left Santa Cruz for improved salary and health benefits offered by Santa Clara and other counties. Nine of those were trained by this county. This is an average of eight years of FTEs, however you want to calculate it. We lost in six years. We need your support to retain our trainees we need to restructure the EHS series to match a comparable Santa Cruz County position, a position also required uh, state licensure. Public health nurses are registered classification with job specs matching closely to ours, SONS, their medical doctrine, and our EHS penal code and, gov and enforcement governance. This comparison is including on the back side of the sheet entitled 2024 registered class comps. Thank you very much for your attention this morning. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kevin Cisneros, currently of Children's Behavioral Health, formerly of Merck Crisis. I'm here to highlight how the county management and personnel's ongoing mistreatment of not just behavioral health, but all county workers results in the inadequate care for our community. In September 2023, the civil grand jury reported that county behavioral health workers were underfunded, understaffed, and overworked. We are still severely understaffed to the point of dysfunction. The Crisis Now Innovation Project, led by Crisis Director James Russell and Crisis Manager Danielle Long, has continued this trend by their push to implement 24-7, 365 services and forcing increased workloads onto an already overworked, burned-out staff. The management team, along with County Behavioral Health Director Tiffany Cantrell-Warren and Claire Schwartz, completely disregarded the meet-and-confer process with the union, which is meant to protect workers from overwork, fatigue, and guarantee the full, full staffing of public services. The union and county workers have constantly brought up how being overworked and covering crisis 24-7, 365 impacts a staff of six. Personnel insist this additional work can be done even when we are forced to respond anytime, anywhere in the county, <clears throat> and still report back early the next day with little or no sleep, making it dangerous to drive when fatigued. When we ask for fatigue protection, when working throughout the night, the county told us to use vacation time. Recently, the Merck team was given notice of schedules changing to a four-day, 10-hour schedule next week, and we'll be covering the 24-7, 365 Crisis Now project. Our crisis team will be working 10 hours a day during normal shifts and be on call throughout the evening, night, early, mor early morning, weekends, and holidays thereafter, despite the union and workers invoking a cease and desist order to protect workers' health. Crisis now management and county personnel do not care how stress hinders workers' ability to provide safe, adequate care to the community and how additional force duty puts community health at risk. Management's unwillingness to consider health risk shows their disregard for community's health as well. This is not how you treat workers who are providing vital and life-saving services to community. Management and personnel should be ashamed of themselves that their poor choices to push staff to the brink of exhaustion has risked community safety. Thank you. 
on strike ready. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Andrew Simone. I work with the MERT team, also Mobile Emergency Response Team. You can move the mic up. All right, thank you. There you go. Um, and as of yesterday evening, I was uncertain whether I'd have a job next Monday. I have been granted a four-week period to secure additional child care to what my family already pays to accommodate for the sweeping changes being introduced by the County Behavioral Health Crisis Team. These changes include weekend to weekday schedule that is not child-friendly and entails hours that are impractical, especially when I often serve as the sole caregiver for my two-year-old. Additionally, as part of the Crisis Now Innovation Project, there is the requirement for mandatory 24-7 on-call crisis work, which may involve clinicians responding to individuals experiencing suicidal radiation or psychosis at any hour of the night. This 24-7 crisis response is directed by a policy that was specifically modified in 2023 to not be utilized for crisis work with personnel and management refusing to craft a new one specific to this task because it requires them to sit down and negotiate with the union prior to rolling it out. This 24-7 on-call response ability will be shared among six clinicians, including myself, making the decision to stay a clear choice to reconsider. County workers and their union representatives have tirelessly advocated for fair wages, adequate rest, and respect in their roles. However, negotiations have been met with resistance. A request for equitable pay and rest have been outright denied. As mental health clinicians, we work hard and endure significant emotional stress, which takes a toll over time. We strive to keep your children and loved ones safe during times of crisis. To continue to do our jobs effectively, we need time to maintain our own mental health. Instead of increased pay, we have been given extended hours. Instead of respect, we have been met with patronizing attitudes, stonewalling, and deceptive tactics aimed at undermining our value. This heavy-handed approach by management shows a blatant disregard for the dedication and hard work we put into our roles. Living in one of the most expensive counties in the country for two consecutive years, my wife and I both work full-time jobs to make ends meet. We make significant sacrifices to live here, but I will not sacrifice myself to a program that does not value my time, skill, or well-being. This is why I've already completed a strike commitment card with my union and will encourage my coworkers to do the same. I am deeply disappointed that a government employer whose core mission includes serving families and children and fails to upload the values it professes when it comes to working with its dedicated staff. While we are required to complete numerous trauma-informed person-centered trainings to perform our jobs, we are deprived of the same level of care and consideration from our employer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. I'm Jeffrey Arl here this morning representing the Santa Cruz County Mental Health Advisory Board. The board thanks you for your swift response to our letter of recommendation, which appears as item 31 in today's consent agenda and reads as follows. Direct the chair to send a letter to our legislative representatives and Governor Newsom in support of House Resolution 8575, the Michelle Alyssa Go Act, which would revise the definition of institution for mental diseases under the Medicaid program to exempt institutions with 36 beds or less. We thank you for going beyond what we requested by including Governor Newsom as a recipient of the letter. And we thank you for your ongoing service to our community. Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a rural resident of Santa Cruz County in District 2. I want to thank your board for your uh, timely response to the Santa Cruz County Grand Jury investigation reports. I think the Grand Jury has done an excellent job this year in particular on their findings. I want to ask, talk with you especially about your responses to the one about roads, county roads. And first of all, I want to thank the Public Works staff. They do a good job. But your responses to the grand jury report are inadequate. I'm concerned that uh, your the county refuses to make public the amount of money that is spent each year on projects within each of the three districts of um, county service area 9D, 1 through 3, and does not intend to make that public information. I'm also... Um, distraught that the grand jury's excellent recommendation R8 that the county dedicate 10 percent of the newly passed measure k sales tax that was sold to the voters to help pay for roads and things fire 
that 10% go to fund to repair and, and maintain roads with a low paving index, saving what is out there that's in bad shape, but not letting it go further. I'm disturbed to hear that there is a policy that your board, the county has, that will allow these roads to continue to deteriorate to a point that you will abandon them and that your your board response refuses to make that policy known to the public and to the property owners associated. Um, there are many other things that I'm worried about. I know that in the past, the county did oil and screen regularly on rural roads and kept them from getting worse, and I don't see that happening in the county. Thank you so much. Thank you for the response. All right, are there any members of the public who are still in the room who haven't had a chance to speak? Um, if you'd like to come to the podium, now's the time. Seeing none, are there any members of the public online who'd like to address us at this time? Yes, sure, we do have speakers online. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on war than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death, Martin Luther King Jr. He also stated, referred to my country as the greatest purveyor of death in the world. So true today is my comment. It seems to me that substance abuse also refers to pharmaceutical drugs like the COVID shots, which are documented to cause adverse reactions, including death. Valuable source of uh, factual information is from westonaprice.org in this document called COVID Shots for Adults and Children, What We Know Now. And here's just one of the figures under adverse reactions are not rare. As of May 12, 2023, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System displayed nearly 2.5 million adverse events following the COVID, in quotes, vaccination, including over 35,000 reported deaths. That's from VAERS, the government official reporting system. Another excellent source of facts is from a local author recent book called The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines, Exposing the Vaccine Orthodoxy by Leon Canarot. The second edition is out and can be ordered via Amazon. There's a section here so on COVID-19. Tim, your microphone's now available. Hello, thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, so, well, I'm on the other side of the camp on that one. Enough of the uh, COVID shot conspiracy. Um, if MPOX takes off, that is, a, that is a dire threat to my son and my family, okay? He, unfortunately for him, he has a pe serious peanut allergy, fish allergy, and eczema issue. And the only way he can survive smallpox or mpox whipping through a community is with herd immunity and everybody vaccinated, okay? So he might be able to take the, the new Hineos vaccine because that's not a live virus vaccine, all right? Vaccines can kill people, yes, okay? But against a serious virus, your odds are, are in favor of the vaccine, okay? So um, leap blowers. All right, everyone's gonna have to give me an exception. Manu, you need to come up, up the road here, up off of Miller, cut off of Miller Hill and drive around that corner. Um, folks are not going to complain about me using a gas blower here to do county work, to save a bunch of kids on a school bus coming around a sharp corner with a lot of water and debris, okay? So that's how that's gonna go. Um, in regards to uh, environmental and human health, this is where I'm supportive, okay? 
My mother, okay, she worked as a receptionist in healthcare for five decades, and I was child labor in the state of Nevada, all right? So that's how that goes. So even though I'm a huge fan of Truman and Eisenhower, okay, I take the conservative hat off a little bit for human health, okay? So anyways, time's out. So I think that's everything. Oh, one more thing. Nuke stockpiles are going up. There's no way. This is, again, I'm breaking here. Our cost for defense is 2% of GDP. It needs to go up to 5%. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll close oral communications and bring it back to the board for any comments or questions on items that are on the consent agenda. I'll start with Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to begin by actually thanking you, Supervisor Cummings, uh, for item 31, directing the chair to send a letter of support for House Resolution 8575, revising the definition of institutions of mental diseases uh, to exempt institutions with 36 beds or less. This is a sort of obscure federal law right now that restricts us to having only 16 uh, beds at our psychiatric facility if we're going to receive federal funding for it. Uh, and it would be fantastic for that law to change and to be able to add an additional 20 beds as soon as possible. I was actually in the middle of uh, drafting a letter when uh, I saw this show up on our agenda. So um, I really appreciate you putting this on for the whole board to consider. Then um, on item 46, accepting Habitat for Humanities Rodeo Creek Court project as complete. I want to take this opportunity uh, to congratulate Habitat for Humanity on their good work at this site. Uh, and also for everyone uh, here at the county that worked uh, on this project, this was um, 11 homes that have been built on a former county-owned redevelopment site. And um, I'm sure some of my colleagues will remember this project as it uh, worked its way through approvals. And um, you know, I think ultimately was actually reduced in scope from I think about 17 homes down to the 11 that were actually built. And uh, what really impressed me the most uh, is I had opportunity to uh, go out there and celebrate the. Um, uh, you know, key giving ceremonies for each one of the families that moved in. And it really left the impression on me that you know, it, we talk a lot about units of housing up here, but each one of those units is a home for uh, often a, a whole family that is contributing immensely to our community. And, um, you know, it's always scary when uh, when new projects are built, but this one really demonstrates that it can be done tastefully, uh, can actually enhance the community. Um, I know a lot of the residents there on Harper Street were scared at first to seeing this project proposed that it would radically alter the, the nature of that neighborhood. But uh, in fact, it's proved to be uh, a huge uh, positive addition. So I uh, hope we'll keep that in mind as, uh, as we move forward. And um, again, congratulations to Habitat on that. Um, wanted to say a few words on item 23, approving responses to three 23, 24 civil grand jury reports, including one uh, on roads titled Santa Cruz County Local Roads, a smooth path through paradise or a hell of a road. Um, want to thank the grand jury for this report. Um, it talks about the backlog preferred maintenance, which, you know, uh, estimates vary, but are roughly three quarters to uh, of a billion dollars to a billion dollars. Um, and uh, you know, I, I can't say that I, I agree with every one of uh, our responses wholeheartedly. Uh, I mean, I'm going to vote to approve this today because a lot of the policies, policy decisions about roads are not going to be made purely in our responses to this particular document. But I think it's uh, worth the board, board noting um, that just, you know, a, another red flag when it comes to our roads. Uh, what we've seen is that um, while we you know, often hear grumbling about our roads, that that grumbling can uh, raise to a roar when those roads actually wash out, as we've seen with, for example, Mountain Charlie Road, which we'll be taking action to address today. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope that uh, my colleagues will consider ways to uh, particularly address some of the uh, urgent deferred maintenance when it comes to culverts so that uh, we can prevent some of these larger washouts in the future, uh, particularly as we're seeing uh, FEMA funding become harder and harder to get. I think it uh, would behoove us to take uh, action on preventative maintenance to prevent those larger slides from happening in the first place. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just briefly speak on item 47, which is in regards to the Pajaro 
levy project. This is a, another significant investment and improvements in the Pajaro levy in advance of uh, what should hopefully be an official groundbreaking at some point later this fall, which we're very excited about to finally get that project underway. But this is an uppermost levy section of work and a, and a partnership with Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency, um, which I serve on with Supervisor. Uh, Hernandez, and this is this really in advance of winter getting this work done is going to uh, hopefully address that vulnerability in that section. But it just continues to show the county's commitment to investment in the levy, uh, and ideally the the major project starting this this fall or early winter, which would be um, what people have been waiting seventy years for. So it's a, a pretty significant commitment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple of items. Um, on number, item number 25, the cannabis report. I want to thank the cannabis licensing office for this report. And it will be my last uh, cannabis report as supervisor. Thank God. Um, so I think, so I think it's a good time to thank our staff, uh, uh, Sam Laforte, Mel uh, Melody Sereno, and various uh, staffs, uh, sheriff's personnel as well. Uh, many are here today uh, for their work over the years in improving our ordinance. Uh, cannabis, cannabis has been uh, a very difficult policy issue, to say the least. So much uh, of what affects the total industry is determined by forces outside of our control on a state and federal level and, of course, uh, the marketplace. But with the tools that we have at our disposal, we have made uh, efforts to make um, to strike a balance uh, between uh, supporting cannabis as a local industry while focusing on safety and quality of uh, life issues uh, for the community at large. Um, the ongoing concern of mine, um, which I hope the future board might consider, is reducing our local taxes on cannabis to encourage greater participation uh, in the regulated market rather than uh, the illicit market. Um, it, Attorney General uh, Rob uh, Bonta, State General, uh, Attorney General uh, Rob Bonta, has suggested uh, the same related to state taxes uh, in comments that were included in our report uh, that is quite long if you want to read it today. Uh, item number 37, um, hazard mitigation grant. I want to thank the staff of the Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience for producing this grant and helping our county to better uh, prepare for future ha hazardous impacts that we might have in our critical infrastructure. We have witnessed seven federally uh, declared disaster in as many years as has been mentioned often. And we know that climate change uh, weather events are likely to occur again uh, and impact our critical infrastructure. Um, I'm a really uh, especially uh, appreciative of the partnership uh, with OR3 uh, has developed with the four cities and other special districts that we have uh, throughout the county to make sure we have a current plan that works for the entire county. Um, and then as a, a combination of items 49 through 52 on the ongoing emergency storm repairs, uh, thank the Public Works Department team with our Community Development and Infrastructure Department uh, for this ongoing work uh, on our storm reports. Uh, these kinds of items are included in almost every board agenda, but I think it's worth noting that uh, uh, again today that in light of other items we have on today's regular agenda related to the, the mountain charlie road as well as items uh, 55 our 6.2 million dollar pavement program from uh, 2023 managing repairs um, to damaged roadways dating back to 2017 has been a an enormous task and a lift for the public works department and has required a great deal of um, of time and money and the county is still uh, hoping to be reimbursed from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which uh, very disappointingly uh, and understandably, it says it's out of money because of the tremendous amount of uh, disasters that have happened throughout this nation. Uh, we are working hard. We've made improvements with the money we have. We we are really desperate to be repaid for those uh, the, the uh, allocations that we've made and the repairs that we've done for the people of Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. And just really brief, uh, 32 and 47, uh, I just want to thank and give kudos to Annabelle Rodriguez for uh, the going on the Workforce Development Board. As an at-large representative, it's a former colleague of mine from Cabrillo as well, from South County. Uh, and with item 47, um, I guess uh, kind of ditto what uh, 
Supervisor Zach Friend said, and you know, I want to thank CDI and of course Pervma for the continued efforts and flood mitigation work that's being done uh, on the Paro Levy. That's it. All right. Well, I'll be brief. Um, I'm number thirty-one. I just want to thank um, our Mental Health Advisory Board for bringing attention to um, House Resolution eighty-five seventy-five, uh, the Michelle Melissa Go Act, um, which, as was mentioned earlier would revise the definition of Institute for Mental Disease under the Medicaid program to exempt institutions with 36 beds or less. I think we're always trying to figure out how we can increase psychiatric beds for folks in our community who, who need the services. And this would not only allow for the number of beds to be expanded, but it would allow for federal funds to cover the cost of those beds. And I think as we're trying to look for how we can afford to expand our programs and services in our community, this is one way where the federal government can really help support us. But it does just go to show that, you know, when our commissions are really helping us to identify different policies that we're able to support, whether it's at the state or federal level, um, that we're able to take action on those because as much as we're trying to be on top of everything that's going on, when there's more eyes out there, it really makes it easier for us to be able to help support our community. So really want to just um, thank um, that commission for, for bringing this to our attention. And then I'll just um, share some of the comments that were made by Supervisor McPherson as it relates to storm damage. Um, as we recently have been made aware, FEMA's you know not really wanting to take on projects that are not um, for life, health, and immediate safety needs. And you know we've got millions of dollars worth of projects that that are going to need to be funded, and we don't know what's going to happen in this next uh, storm season. And so my hope is that we can continue to advocate for FEMA to um, please reimburse us for these projects that we were we thought that we were going to be getting reimbursed for in the past and that they continue to make those funds available in the future because um, as we're seeing across the United States this summer, um, the impacts of climate change are just getting worse, and we're going to need all the support we can to keep our community afloat. And so with that, I will turn to the clerk and see if we can, well, actually, I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's a motion on the consent. I'll move consent to the second. Okay, so a motion by Supervisor Hernandez, second by Supervisor Friend, and I'll turn to the clerk for a roll call vote on the consent agenda. Certainly, Supervisor. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, so moving on to our regular agenda, I just want to announce a couple changes. Um, given the number of people who are here for item number eight, I think we're going to go ahead and move that one up, and then we'll follow that with item number seven, if that's okay, and I'll check in with county council, see if that's okay. I'm getting the nod, yes. And then just another quick announcement. Um, there will be a single presentation for items numbers 11, 12, and 13, and a single um, public comment for those three items, given that they're all related to um, our commissions and changes to certain commissions. And so just wanted to make sure that my colleagues were aware of that and the public was aware as we move into our regular agenda. And so with that, um, we will, I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Supervisor Zach Friend and Bruce McPherson to introduce item number eight, consider approving appointment of Chris Clark to the position of Santa Cruz County Sheriff. And with that, I'll turn it to my colleagues on the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I have the distinct honor of, along with Supervisor McPherson, putting forward an item today to uh, have this board consider the appointment of Under Sheriff Chris Clark to the position of Santa Cruz County Sheriff, effective uh, when Sheriff Jim Hart officially retires in December. Um, I've had the honor of working with Mr. Clark from my time actually preceding my time here when I worked at the Santa Cruz Police Department, and I actually cannot think of anybody in this community or anybody throughout the state that'd be more qualified to serve as Santa Cruz County Sheriff than Chris Clark. He has the compassion, the worldview, the dignity, the ethics, um, the approach that will make you absolutely represent our community uh, at the highest level. In addition, he has a collaborative spirit that is not necessarily seen throughout sheriff's departments and boards of supervisors in this state or over this country for that matter. There, there's usually a tension and that tension does not exist here. There also is an attention between the sheriff's office and other local, local law enforcement agencies as evidenced by those that are here today. And I did outreach to a number of the chiefs in the local law enforcement agencies, and it was hard to get them off the phone because they were saying such amazing things about you. Um, you also have the support of your entire membership who have reached out to us. Also, not necessarily a common case throughout this state. Um, to me, the fact that we have such a homegrown talent inside 
is a real gift. There are a lot of agencies across this state that have seen significant turnover uh, at that position. And to have this continuity, uh, to have this skill set, to have that camaraderie within your agency and other agencies, and to have that relationship and mutual respect that you have with our board and uh, other elected throughout this county uh, is unparalleled. Um, the board letter talks a little bit about your background. I know you're going to talk a little bit about, about your background. It's beautiful to see your, your family here today as well. You have a very unique background, I think, for coming into law enforcement. Um, I mean, I know you were born overseas. I know you, you know, your family from a military family uh, took you to a lot of different places, exposed you to a lot of different cultures and a lot of different um, backgrounds that, in my opinion, I've seen you then use uh, to inform your policing style, one that recognizes that sometimes when folks engage with law enforcement, it's not their best day. Um, and you have this broader perspective as to what might be bringing somebody before local criminal justice system in a way that I think is unique for law enforcement. I also think is a model for law enforcement um, across this country. I recognize that there's been some questions asked about just the general timing of it, given the fact that um, Sheriff Hart retires in December. Uh, why would we be doing this now as opposed to at the last possible minute? And one of the main reasons is to ensure continuity, to ensure that there is enough time to have an adequate transition internally uh, to ensure that smooth transition. At the end of the day, whether it's today or December, you're going to get appointed to this role because you are the best qualified person in this community to do it. Your team wants you internally. The external folks want you. And so it makes the most sense to telegraph that message to internal and external folks that we should have this time for the smoothest possible transition and also respect the wishes of um, every member of the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office that sent us this letter saying that we want you to be that leader. Um, Supervisor McPherson has worked with you closely, in particular with the disaster response. I worked with you on the floods. He worked with you on the fires where you just were a calming presence on, on, uh, for not just us, but for the community more broadly. He was very um, excited about the possibility of bringing this forward. So I want to hand it over to my co-signatory on this, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you, Supervisor Friend, for bringing this item to the office, uh, uh, to my office, and to appoint uh, Chris Clark as our next uh, sheriff in Santa Cruz County. I, I want to begin by acknowledging the hard work and de dedication of our current sheriff, Jim Hart, who has been a leader in this field for a long time, public service in his various roles of the sheriff's office. It's been tremendous. He is uh, Sheriff Hart has seen his department uh, go through a great deal of challenges in recent years, including the loss of uh, Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler uh, in June 2020, the CU CCU fire evacuation just two months later, and various difficult financial situations involving the county jail and other facilities. And I also want to point out uh, in another facet of the Sheriff's Office, uh, that Sheriff's Office under Jim Hart, was one of the first to implement the community policing uh, uh, program that President Obama really pushed. And we were front and center on that. And Jim, but the reason why is because of uh, Sheriff Jim Hart. We uh, certainly uh, understand his um, decision to retire and we'll have more on that for him at a later time. Uh, in the meantime, it's my honor to recommend to the board that we appoint Chris Clark, uh, who has demonstrated the highest level of uh, professional qualification for the service to be our next sheriff of Santa Cruz County. As the undersheriff, uh, he has proven to be dedicated and responsive to the community needs, as uh, Supervisor Friend has said time and time again, disaster in, disaster out, uh, always dealing with situations calmly and diffusing tension. Uh, critical in that office. I, he is uh, solutions oriented and always delivers service with a smile. He has been a, a terrific partner for my office over the years, and I know that he will be a great partner for the people of Santa Cruz County and, uh, and the other uh, criminal justice agencies in Santa Cruz County. I look forward more to working with him during the remaining four months of my term on the board. I just want to say that uh, we're just very fortunate to have a, a qualified classy person as Cliff Chris Clark to be our next sheriff of Santa Cruz County. Thank you very much. Okay. I think what we'll do in terms of process, I'll give you an opportunity to address the board and the public followed by um, opening up for public comment. And then bring it back to the board for final discussion and for action. So I'll turn it over to Chris Clark. Absolutely. And good morning. Good morning, Chair Cummings, Vice Chair Hernandez and Supervisor's friend McPherson and Koenig. Uh, my name is Chris Clark, and I'm the Inter Sheriff of Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of working with each one of you in the communities you serve. 
And I, I know you want a responsive sheriff's office. I know you want your community safe, and I want those exact same things. My wife, Sarah, and I have three boys. Each have gone to local schools, including Cabrillo. Your safety, your family safety, and this community's safety is my utmost priority, and that's why I moved here. That's why I, I call this county, this beautiful county, home. I've had the privilege of growing up around the world and learning the beauty of various cultures, but Santa Cruz County's inclusivity and diversity, which is where I want to raise my family and, 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 and start my career. I've had the privilege of working for one of the most progressive law enforcement agencies in the entire country. From the leadership of Sheriff Mark Tracy, Steve Robbins, Phil Wowak, and most recently Sheriff Hart, I'm proud of our office's progressiveness and accomplishments well ahead of many reform measures, which were identified early on to better serve your constituents. The heart of our leadership developed from within has been our strength, leveraged by the great relationships we've maintained with the community, county leadership, and county department heads. I've been on the front of some of the most terrible times this county has had, from the, uh, from the COVID pandemic to the civil disturbances following the murder of George Floyd, to the murder of Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler, to the CZU Lightning Complex fire, to the flood South County and the San Lorenzo Valley. I've had the honor of working alongside great staff who persevered and worked hard to ensure safety for all. I'm excited to wake up and go to work every day because the people I have the great fortune of working with, for, and the communities we serve. I am proud of our agency's culture, one that believes in humble good work, public service, and, and improving outcomes for all. As you know, our office is charged with many responsibilities aside from basic police. Our mandate extends to court security, management of four correctional facilities, coroner duties, serious investigations, warrants, civil processes, in addition to responding when people need help. I've worked or led every aspect of this office and have had great mentors like Sheriff Hart and so many others. I can say confidently I understand our business as well as the way we carry out those duties, which is equally important in partnership with you and your constituents. If your board sees fit, I plan to work with Sheriff Hart on a smooth transition. And I plan to work on a, on a number of things to include been working over the last year on reinstituting in-person visits at both our Blaine Street and R&R &R facility down in Watsonville, which is extremely important for parents of, uh, of incarcerated children and, and, uh, and, incur and uh, children of incarcerated parents. I'm going to continue to work on the fentanyl crisis that plagues our that plagues our county and work in collaboration with community stakeholders, county and state partners and targeting high level dealers who choose to make this someplace they want to do business. I'll be working to staff and certify our DNA lab. As you know, our lab uh, is able to promote equitable justice for those underserved and overrepresented in crimes such as sexual assault. Our lab is the ability to expedite the time survivors and their families can feel a sense of justice, which some, which for some comes too late or not at all. We need to improve facilities charged with medical and mental health care for our incarcerated population. Given the rise in mental health and substance use disorder, it's no secret that our office is running one of the largest mental health facilities in the county. Our main jail was designed around a population served in the 1970s and built in 1980. A modern facility to treat our incarcerated population only leads to better outcomes. Uh, in safer communities and is, and is in line with state and county health mandates. With your support and in partnership with you and those that call Santa Cruz County home, I promise to do everything in my power to continue to build on ways to better protect our families and support our staff who show up every day in service to make things better. I believe the future of our office and county is bright, and I appreciate your consideration to lead our agency into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to open it up to the public to see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak on this item. If so, please approach the podium. You'll be given two minutes to speak. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. Um, right now we have uh, candidates that haven't been voted by anybody and enjoying the uh, position of incumbent. Uh, just I hope you uh, don't go along with the uh, former sheriff. There were two granges, one in Aptos and one on 17th Avenue, where a group called Freedom Forum was, after 10 years, they've held candidates' nights, which some of you have been at. Uh, but because the speaker was brought there, two members of this Board of Supervisors, in fact, one that just endorsed the sheriff, the sheriff would not report that these grid board of directors of these granges, both their persons and property, were threatened. And that was also done by an organization called COPA, which I believe the county subsidizes in one way or another. But anyway, uh, the fact that those people ended up having to meet 
you know, on the beach uh, is outrageous. And the First Amendment comes first. And I hope that you would uh, respect, uh, treat everybody the same when somebody gets a threat for persons and property that you will act on it as did not the present sheriff. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mark Stone. I've had the pleasure of sitting up there as well as had a bit of a statewide view. I, I can tell you uncategorically that this sheriff's department is absolutely the best in the state. You'll see headlines about sheriffs from time to time from other counties, and it's usually not good. You don't have to look very far to see some of the challenges that sheriffs have brought to their communities. That's never been the case here. Go back to Mark Tracy and Steve Robbins and Phil Wowak. I'm forgetting somebody, I'm not sure. Uh, there's a legacy here that has been passed on again and again and again. Picking the right candidate, picking the right sheriff, is absolutely critical for our community. Somebody who understands our community, someone who's willing to work with our community. And we know this is not the easiest community to work with. Look where Jim Hart's been in the news, helping, leading, out there to make sure that our communities are safe, are protected, disaster or no. Jim has been one of the most outstanding sheriffs and again, fitting in this community. And so what does this mean? That means Chris Clark is really the next best person to be doing this. I'm hoping to see a unanimous vote here. I can't tell you how I hated sitting there. People say, I want to see a unanimous vote. But in this case, aligning with a sheriff candidate who will carry that legacy, who is someone this county will be proud of and be one of that long list of sheriffs who stand out in a state where the, the politics doesn't always make it easy to be in law enforcement. That's why this department is excellent. And if you want to maintain that excellence in Santa Cruz County, your candidate is Chris Clark. I have to follow Mark Stone. Um, I just wanted to say, as a community-based organization CEO and being at Janus for um, the last 23 years in multiple roles and more recently, the last three years as the CEO, it's been such an honor to serve alongside Sheriff Hart and seeing just how much um, humanistic approach that he has to community policing and helping people. The Sobering Center and the Recovery Center is a really beautiful rendition of that um, work. And so it's been such an honor to serve alongside you. And we've had many conversations, but hopefully uh, get to serve alongside you and continue our work on the fentanyl crisis and opioid crisis. So thank you. Look forward to you getting appointed today. Congratulations. And thank you so much for all of your service. Sheriff Hart. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Ferris Sabah. I work as your county superintendent of schools. And I'm here in support of Chris Clark's appointment as our next sheriff. I'd like to tell you just briefly why I think he'd be a wonderful sheriff in our in our county. We've worked on several projects together, the educational community, working with with uh, with Sheriff Hart and and with Chris Clark, the under sheriff, uh, working on fentanyl awareness, working on school safety protocols, uh, with diversion programs, educational programming in for those in custody, and a variety of other other kinds of projects where uh, the needs of the community and the partnership that we have between the school system and the sheriff's office have been paramount. The character, this, the characteristics that I see um, in Chris Clark are those of integrity and compassion. Uh, he has a collaborative spirit and he's very thoughtful about the work to be done, recognizing the complexities of any decisions that are made at, at, in a position uh, that he holds and uh, his responsiveness and his sense of dignity for our community. Uh, these are the things that we look for in, in our partnerships, and these are the things we strive for as leaders in our community. I think Chris Clark is going to be an outstanding sheriff, and I hope you will consider his appointment today. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cummings, Board of Supervisors, and CAO Palacios. I'm Heather Rogers. I have the privilege of serving as your public defender, and I'm here to express my support for Under Sheriff Chris Clark. 
Over my past three years as public defender, I've had the privilege of getting to know under Sheriff Clark, and I can say without hesitation that he is open-minded, he is collaborative, and he is absolutely committed to this community. When we first opened the county public defender office a little over two years ago, we knew that we needed the sheriff's support to achieve our vision to provide holistic, client-centered, and zealous representation to the people of Santa Cruz County. We knew that we wanted to provide early representation to people incarcerated at the jail by getting defenders in there as close to law enforcement contact as possible. We knew that we needed improved access for our defenders to see their clients, and we knew that we needed to reinstate contact visits between incarcerated caregivers and parents and their children. I can say that with the support of Sheriff Hart, his team, and the leadership of Under Sheriff Chris Clark, we have achieved progress on all these fronts and more. We don't share the same role. We will not always have the same point of view, but I know for certain that we share the same values, we share the same commitment to this community, and that we can work together collaboratively to serve the citizens of Santa Cruz County. I believe that strong public defense is critical to public safety, and I look forward to working with Under Sheriff Clark and his team for years to come as we continue to bring courage, compassion, and community to Santa Cruz. Thank you. Good morning, board and CAO Palacios. I'm Valerie Thompson. I'm the assistant chief of probation. On, on behalf of our chief, Fernando Geraldo, I'm here to express our support for Chris Clark as sheriff. We have a longstanding relationship with the sheriff's department under Sheriff Hart, several successful grant programs and ongoing programs that we are working on both the adult and the juvenile side. Each time we reach out to Chris, Chris Clark, he is there for us. His partnership is invaluable to us, and currently he is actually working with our juvenile division leadership to scale diversion opportunities for young people in the community who don't need to be justice involved. Often you will not hear of law enforcement looking for ways to keep people out of the system because most people think, oh, their job is to detain and ensure community safety in that way. But Chris Clark sees community safety broadly and in the way, in the view of diversion and prevention work. So we are very excited that he will be appointed as the sheriff so that we can continue our ongoing partnership, both to serve young people and their families, ensure outcomes of well-being, and also to support the adults that we work with in our system. I want to give you one example of how committed Chris is, Chris is to his work. I called him a few months ago around 9, 10 o'clock at night. I think we worked until almost midnight just to keep one young lady out of our juvenile facility because she had suffered so much trauma. It was his idea and he knew that this young lady did not need to come into our juvenile facility. So we worked together to look for solutions that she did not have to come into our facility, suffer more trauma and could be served in the community in the way that she needed to be. I think this is just but one example of his commitment and his collaboration and also what we see in his staff and his team that we encounter every day. The culture of the sheriff's department is one of collaboration and partnership. It values both prevention, diversion, and equity. And we are proud to partner with the sheriff's department and continue the work that started under Sheriff Hart with who we hope to be Sheriff Chris Clark. So thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Cummings, board members. My name is Jeff Roselle, and I am honored to be the Santa Cruz County District Attorney. And I'm here today to voice my support for Chris Clark as Sheriff. And I say this as somebody who has had the benefit of working with Chris throughout every single stage of his career in the Sheriff's Office. Chris Clark is the right choice, the perfect choice for the citizens of Santa Cruz County for the sheriff's office and the law enforcement community in general, and quite frankly, for those being investigated or accused of a crime. Chris Clark is compassionate, cooperative, and deeply committed to public safety. I cannot say enough about Chris Clark 
And I can tell you without reservation, this is the right choice for everybody. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Ethan Rumrill. I'm currently the president of the Deputy Sheriff's Association here in Santa Cruz. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this matter. Uh, I'd like to begin with a brief acknowledgement and thank, thank you to uh, our current Sheriff Hart, who will be retiring uh, after some 36 years of public service, which I need not state is a very, very long time to be in public service, especially in a profession as demanding as ours. So thank you to Sheriff Hart for his long role of leadership and participation in our in our county affairs. Um, you've heard from several people uh, before me very, in various positions throughout the county um, endorsing the appointment of Under Sheriff Chris Clark, and I'm here to do the same thing on the behalf of my association. Um, the sheriff has made his recommendation as Under Sheriff Clark taking the reins to lead the office forward in the same vein that he was striving to do for the last 10 years. And you've heard people from all different parts of the county echoing what a remarkable uh, leader Chris Clark is and, and why he's so qualified for the job. But I can really think of no better testament than that of the people that work for him. Um, in my current position, I represent everybody from deputy sheriff trainees that are currently attending the police academy all the way up into the upper levels of administration at the sheriff's office. And I can tell you that we support wholeheartedly uh, the appointment of Chris Clark to the sheriff position. Um, if you take a brief look around the room, you'll notice the overwhelming show of support, both people in uniform and in plain clothes that have come out today to uh, express their support for Sheriff Chris, for a Sheriff Chris Clark, excuse me. And I would like to say that on behalf of our association, I would like to uh, just note that he is the most qualified and capable person that we would love to see lead our office. Thank you for your time. Good morning, board. Uh, my name is Mark Rania. I'm the vice president of the uh, Corrections Officer Corrections uh, Office Officer Association. Sorry about that. A little nervous. I can't lie. Um, so I'm going to be reading a, a brief um, letter that was written by our president, who couldn't be here today. Uh, so on behalf of the Santa Cruz County um, Santa Cruz Sheriff's Correctional Officer Association, uh, we are we are writing to formally show support of Under Sheriff Chris Clark uh, for the position of interim sheriff, and hopefully, you know, the full time sheriff. Uh, following the upcoming retirement of Sheriff Jim Hart in December. Under Sheriff Clark has constantly demonstrated a commitment to improving the conditions within the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office, particularly during his tenure as the chief at the jail, uh, his efforts to enhance the work environment for correctional, correctional staff and to improve conditions for inmates uh, have, have not only increased morale among our ranks, uh, but have also contributed to a uh, a more effective correctional system. His leadership during this time was instrumental in fostering a culture of respect, safety, and continuous improvement. Since stepping into the role of undersheriff, Chris Clark has continued to advance the mission of, this, of the sheriff's office by implementing reforms and initiatives that benefit both the staff and the broader community. His experience, dedication, and vision make him an ideal candidate to lead the department during this transitional period. The Santa Cruz County, the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Corrections Officer Association firmly believes the under Sheriff Clark will build on the progress made under Sheriff Hart and continue to steer the department towards excellence. We are confident that his leadership will ensure stability and ongoing improvements within the Sheriff's Office, <clears throat> benefiting both our members and the residents of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we respectfully urge the Board of Supervisors to appoint Chris Clark as the interim sheriff, as we believe he is the most qualified and capable candidate to lead our department through this important time of transition. Uh, thank you for your time. Morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Mike Pruger. I also represent the Deputy Sheriff's Association. I sat in uh, the seat as president for many, many years. I want to first thank uh, Jim Hart for his 36 years of service, the community, his leadership has always been appreciated, and his commitment as well. Uh, Jim has taken the time to mentor many in the sheriff's organization. Part of being sheriff is recognizing that there will be a transition at some point. The Santa Cruz County has never had to recruit a sheriff from outside our ranks. Because we are a small county, we have a close-knit community. We know and get to know families from Watsonville to Bola Creek, which is very important when selecting a person to run an organization that has the ability to affect people's lives so intimately. First of all, Chris Clark is a good friend of mine. 
With that said, he has all the credentials that is that you would expect from a leader of an organization. His leadership experiences include teachings from the Ann Casey Foundation. Uh, Chris also had left his family for several weeks to work as a senior management institute for police in Boston. These learnings have only enhanced Chris's progressive law enforcement commitment to public safety and its services. Those are his resume. I, however, have worked with and with Chris closely while in the coroner's office, a job most deputies don't want and many run from. He understood immediately the importance of this position as you are dealing with people on the worst day of their lives, which requires the ability to have empathy for those you are dealing with. Chris handled this position with grace and decency, with love and kindness. That is who Chris Clark is at his base. He is also has the support of the 400 or so men and women of law enforcement in this community. He has a family who are represented here today. And we have five elected people in this county to make these decisions when they arise. And I hope you are capable of doing the right thing today. I urge you to support Chris Clark today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sheriff, before you come up, I'm wondering if we can get through the folks online and anybody else in the room will leave the final comment for you. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. It is fitting that Sheriff Hart have the last word here. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. Um, I'm here to support the appointment of um, Under Sheriff Chris Clark. And also to thank Sheriff Hart for his good service and very progressive actions, very brave actions. I do have to ask, as a voter, as a member of the public, a, a question about the pattern that I see continuing regarding the sheriff's appointment by the current sheriff retiring, announcing retirement after the deadline for uh, candidates to get their names on the ballot for these elected offices. And that bothers me. It does bother me. I have no hesitation that a good man here is going to step into the role, but it's this pattern that I have seen and is now continuing that bothers me. So I hope, um, under Sheriff Clark, that when you decide to leave, that you will not continue this pattern, that you will give the voters of the whole county, not five here today, the opportunity to vote because when the election comes up next, you will be the incumbent on the ballot. And incumbents always have favorship at the voters, with the voters. I hope that uh, you will, as our sheriff, pay great attention and try to curb the human trafficking that is rampant in this county. California is the highest problematic state for this. Santa Cruz County is the worst within this, the state of California, and I hope that you will do all you can to stop that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'd like to see if there's any, well, before we move on to online, is there any other member of the public here present who'd like to speak to us? Please approach the podium. Hi, my name is Les Gardner, and I uh, really wasn't expecting to speak today, but I, the um, last speaker, I just wanted to correct when saying, uh, if uh, Jim Clark or Jim Hart had uh, resigned eight months ago, it still wouldn't have mattered. Um, Chris Clark, would, which if he was appointed, would still have to run at the end of his term. So um, the, the election for sheriff would not have been uh, in, in this this round or whatever. So that, I just wanted to correct that and make sure that, that everybody understood that it, uh, the timing on this thing um it didn't matter as far as this election. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any members of the public online who would like to speak to us on this item? Yes, Chair. Colin, you do one. Your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett. Um, I, 
I don't know Chris Clark, certainly a lot of praise of him, I hope, um, re is, is reflected in your vote and what takes place in the future. However, I've seen problems with the sheriff uh, department under Jim Hart and uh, Gary Richard Arnold's point about the censorship of the speaker at the Grange. I got to go hear that speaker in the park and I felt um, uh, he was very informative and that this kind of censorship when we're supposed to have a First Amendment is very troubling. That's one point. Another point is that I witnessed a 59 or no, 69 year old friend of mine in a so called wellness uh, check uh, being very viciously treated when six or eight deputies came and forcefully injected her and hauled her away. Uh, that was very troubling, and I put in your hands, Supervisor Koenig, a witness report and complaint that I submitted to you. So you're well aware of this, and I don't think she's the only one this has happened to. The third point is that as a retired school teacher of Pajaro Valley Schools, I often go to school board meetings. You spoke earlier of school safety protocols. Many of the Chicano students testified and their parents of mistreatment they had received with the pretty sure sheriff did deputy security guards. Thank and you, they Ms. Garrett. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, I'd like to invite our current Sheriff Jim Hart to the podium to make some remarks. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Board. Jim Hart, Sheriff Coroner. And uh, first of all, I just, just want to tell you and the community and, and my personnel, uh, this has been an honor of my lifetime uh, to be the county sheriff for the last decade and lead these fantastic people that work at the sheriff's office in corrections out on the law enforcement side and our professional staff. They're just, they're wonderful people. They're committed to the mission of the sheriff's office and they're committed to keeping this community safe. And I, I just couldn't be more proud to have led this organization. Uh, everybody has their expiration date, and and so it's time for me to step down. And when I look around the office, I look around the county, really look around the general area, I don't see anybody more qualified than Chris is to take on this job. He's been part of the executive team now for five years. He's uh, been the undersheriff for two years. So he he's basically run the day-to-day -day operations of the sheriff's office for the last five years and he's done a fantastic job and he's done he's worked very closely with you and your staff members uh we've had a, a pretty wild ride the last seven or eight years in terms of disasters and, and tough events and different things that have come up and chris has been at the leadership role in all of those events and i think he's proven that he's more than capable of doing his job he's highly educated he's got his master's degree uh, he's well thought of, as you can see from the people that, that came today, he's well thought of internally by our office. And then you can see the support that he has from the entire justice system, DA, probation, public defender, uh, and also uh, his relationship with all, all the local police agencies. And you have somebody who, who's going to come in today or, or come in on December 6th, and he already has relationships established with you and your staffs, with our county administrative officer, our county council, all the county department heads, the local police and fire group. Uh, he's He is as plug and, and play as, as of, of a person as, as we could have. And what, what I really appreciate about Chris is he gives things a lot of thought, and he's a kind man. He is a good man, and he's, he's going to treat people with respect. And he's aware that, that we're not always going to get everything that we ask for. But even when we disagree, we shake hands, we move on, and we, and we keep moving forward with county government. So I've dedicated my entire adult life to this job since I was 23 years old. 
uh, 36 years here with the county. It's been a fantastic place to work. And I would not leave the sheriff's office or the county in a bad spot. Uh, the, the part of the reason why I'm leaving at, at the two-year mark is this guy's ready to go. And, and he and bringing in some fresh energy and some fresh ideas is going to be good for the sheriff's office. It's going to be good for the county. It's going to be good for the community. So I just want to let you know that I fully endorse Chris, and I think he's going to be a fantastic sheriff. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, we're going to close public comment. I'll bring it back to the board, and I'll start with uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Well, Chris, I, too, am excited to support your appointment to uh, be our next sheriff. And it's not just because of all the nice things that uh, everyone in this room has said about you. Uh, it's because I've seen the quality of your work firsthand, whether it's responding to disasters like the flooding in SoCal or sitting uh, in community meetings and hearing you know, firsthand feedback from constituents. And then more importantly, seeing you act on it within hours. I mean, that is, I think, what we all want in uh, in our law enforcement is to know uh, that we're heard and that when we have concerns, they're addressed quickly. Uh, you know, I think, Jim, I want to thank you for really building such a fantastic organization. Uh, I had an opportunity to, to sit with Chris on a recruitment and retention panel um, within the, the sheriff's office. And what we heard consistently was, yes, there are challenges, you know, having competitive pay with neighboring uh, neighboring counties and with the sky high cost of housing. But one thing that keeps people here is the quality of the culture. And we owe that, of course, to the, the leadership uh, that we've had at the sheriff's office through your work, Sheriff Jim Hart. And I think it's also clear that Chris, you're the best person to maintain that culture uh, and carry us forward. Um, I really see this as sort of your your magnum opus, Jim, uh, that uh, to to leave us in such good hands and to have such a smooth transition. And to anyone who's concerned, you know that this is not going out to an election. I mean, I, I certainly agree. Elections are important, uh, but first of all, I'd say that I don't think there's any endorsements left for an opponent in this case. We've heard from the district attorney, from the public defender, from the Deputy Sheriff's Association, the Correctional Officer Association, from probation. I mean, everyone who works in this field supports Chris, and that's for good reason. The second thing um, is that I, I, you know, again, back to uh, our current Sheriff Jim Hart, um, I think that in many ways, this is the kind of smooth transition that we've voted for through uh, electing Jim at the most recent uh, election that, uh, he, you know, we we trust in his um, leadership and guidance. And uh, again, this is his magnum opus, the smooth transition uh, to keep our county safe and keeping such a quality organization together here uh, that will now, I hope, be led by Under Sheriff Chris Clark. Thanks. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, I briefly got to work with um, Under Sheriff Chris Clark, and um, I had the opportunity to work with uh, the Under Sheriff during a stressful period in our community um, during the floods of the Interlake and, and College Road area. And, you know, it, it was a stressful period in that area. Residents were you know, at the point of it was they had three floods in that area continuously from January to March. And so folks were just really devastated. And I think, you know, working with the sheriff, he was responsive, uh, respectful and dedicated to the community's needs during a really a time of crisis. And so I respected that. And, you know, he was responsive to the office as well. And today, you know, I think several people mentioned it. We see the support from not only the counterparts of probation, corrections, and DSA and public defender's office and DAs, but we see CBOs here, nonprofits, uh, education, and community members also in support. And so 
it's overwhelming. And so, of course, you know, I want to make sure that we have the best person leading our sheriffs. And I think it's going to be under Sheriff Chris Clark. Um, I think my last comment is, you know, the Sheriff Hart said his expiration date is over, but we still have him till December. His expiration date's not over yet. <laughs> so we'll celebrate uh, Sheriff Hart in December as well. But thank you for, you know, uh, bringing up good candidates as well uh, to, to lead the position after you leave too as well. And so thank you very much. I will. I want to first start by thanking everybody who's here today, um, who's been able to speak to us on this item, and who overwhelmingly are, are in support of appointing Chris Clark as our next interim sheriff. And, you know, just to speak to process, I think that was brought up a little bit earlier. Um, you know, we would have to appoint someone in this position regardless. Um, and while people would like to see um, an election happen, you know, that's that can occur in 2028. And between now and then, this is an opportunity for us to give Chris the opportunity to serve in the role of sheriff and for us to, as a community to be able to see, you know, how well he's able to take on that position. And I think overwhelmingly with the amount of people who have shown up here today and the complete lack of opposition, that it really goes to, to, to show that um, our community trusts uh, Chris to be in that role. They really want to see him in that role. And I think that, um, you know, having worked with Chris as well, I don't think we could elect or appoint a, a more qualified person to be in that position. Um, I'll just say that, you know, when we think about law enforcement, like when people talk about law enforcement at a national level, um, they'll use examples of bad departments and, you know, um, public safety agencies can get a bad rap. Um, but I remember when I was uh, mayor of Santa Cruz after the murder of George Floyd, having conversations with our police department, having conversations with the sheriff department when we were getting demands to, you know, adopt 21st century policing and adopt all these um, policies that different agencies didn't have. And, you know, came to find out and was able to share with the community that Santa Cruz was a leader in a lot of those policies. Santa Cruz had adopted policies that were being brought to our attention in 2020 back in the 90s. And it just shows how progressive of an agency our law enforcement agencies are here locally and so i really just want to thank um sheriff hart for you know taking that leadership and to really be an example for the rest of our nation and you know i guess that just also goes to show that, that you know jim's not just keeping that to himself he's obviously training the people behind him so that they can carry these good policies and efforts forward and as we've seen with the out the overwhelming support of Chris Clark today. I'm confident that we will continue to be able to work together to make sure that we're addressing the needs of our community. We're keeping people safe, but we're also trying to not just have a, um, you know, lock and key approach, just putting people in jail. And for, for whatever reason that we're really trying to be an agency that's looking at bettering people so that we don't have so many people overwhelming our jails. Um, and so, um, I guess I'll just leave my comments there because I could probably go on and on as many of us could. Um, but I think we're going to be really, um, we're really happy to have you, Chris, really happy to support your appointment. And I guess the last thing I'll say is I just want to thank um, Sheriff Hart, um, Chris Clark, and for the rest of the department for being so approachable and collaborative. Um, it really goes a long way, especially as a new supervisor who's really trying to understand your department, how it functions, how we can support you all. Um, because at the end of the day, we really want to take care of each other as a community. And so with that, I will open it up to my fellow co colleagues to see if there's a motion uh, to support Chris Clark as interim sheriff. Yes, Mr. Chair, and um, I know that you generally have a rule where people can't clap, but I can't see the cops doing spirit hands. So, then we'll be, I mean, if you do, I mean, I'll be proud of all of you, but I just don't. Chris, I don't see it. Yeah, I don't see it. So, uh, it's my distinct honor to move the recommended actions, which is to appoint Chris Clark as Santa Cruz County Sheriff, effective 12.01 a.m. on December 6, 2024. Second. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Friend. Second by Supervisor McPherson, and with that, I'll turn to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Chair Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously.
why don't we take a brief break? We'll allow chambers to clear and then we'll move on to our next items. We'll take about a five minute break. We keep going with our meeting. Quite clear, that's good. Yeah. Our next item item number seven our agenda presentation from a representative with rural county representatives of california affiliate golden state finance authority regarding the recover ca home buyer assistance program this was brought forward by um supervisor friend so i'll turn it to him to kick off kick us off thank you mr chair um i'll have a brief introduction i was reached out to by uh the ceo and president of rcrc regarding this remarkable program that it's clear that the community doesn't really know about i'll wait a second we'll wait a second yeah. Megan, we'll come to you in a second. <laughs> All right. I'll turn it back over to Supervisor Friend. All right, we'll get it started again. And I was reached out to the the president and CEO of RCRC regarding uh, the Recover California Home Buyer Assistance Program, which can really dramatically uh, improve an opportunity for my colleagues and their communities who suffered so much under the CZU fires. It's a forgivable loan program for purchasing a home outside of a high fire zone area. This is a significant financial incentive and opportunity, but um, it was a program that I knew very little about until I'd been reached out to. And so they had offered to give a presentation, a brief presentation to us to make sure that the community was aware of this. And so if we could turn it over um, to Megan Harris, who is with Golden State uh, Finance Authority to discuss this program, that'd be great. Thank you, Supervisor Friend, Mr. Chair, fellow supervisors. I'm Megan Harris, Program Administrator with Golden State Finance Authority. As Supervisor Friend mentioned, is also an affiliate entity of RCRC. And before I dive into my presentation, I just want to extend my condolences to the Santa Cruz County community for all the tragedies and disasters it's endured. And I think the fact that the community continues to thrive is a testament to its leadership and the resilience of the community. With that, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Okay. So the Recover California Home Buyer Assistance, this is a new program that we've launched as of June 10th of this year. And the program is, can everyone hear me? I'm so sorry to, to disrupt you, Megan. Um, we just we need to reshare the screens in here. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, I'm just going to go ahead and reshare those those slides one moment. Okay. Can we, okay there you are. Can we also get the sound up a little bit more? Just it's hard to hear it. Okay, are we are we are we ready? Sounds good. Okay, awesome. So as I mentioned, the Recover California Home Buyer Assistance Program is designed to provide home buying assistance to residents of Santa Cruz County and other counties that were impacted by wildfires in 2018 and 2020. Santa Cruz was obviously impacted by the CZU fire in 2020, which renders its eligibility. But the assistance is going to provide up to $350,000 in home buying assistance to help low to moderate income households purchase a home outside of a high risk area. And so the target population for this program are folks who resided in Santa Cruz County in a high or very high risk area for wildfires. And the program itself has $28 million in funding. And this funding was provided by the housing, the Department of Housing and Community Development, 
which was supplied by HUD through their community development block for disaster recovery. And so GSFA is essentially the program manager or administrator of the program. GSFA itself is a housing finance agency. So we're positioned to manage this program. We have over 31 years of experience providing access to affordable home ownership to Californians. And the primary way we do that is through enhancing ordinary mortgage loans with down payment and closing cost assistance. And so far we've helped over 85,700 families with over $664 million in down payment assistance so far. And there's a reason why we're passionate about improving home ownership opportunities for Californians. We can't ignore the tangible benefits of home ownership. Home ownership has been proven to in impact uh, positive uh, results on families and communities. It improves stability in neighborhoods, increases educational achievement, civic engagement, and even improves physical and psychological health, right? Because when people don't have to worry about the stability of their home life, they're more likely to be productive in other areas. It also reduces crime, right? And so there's, again, those tangible impacts. And then of course, we cannot overlook the financial benefits of home ownership. According to the Federal Reserve 2022 Survey of Community of uh, Consumer Finances, the average, the median homeowner has a net worth of that of 38 times more than a non-homeowner. So for example, the median homeowner, if we were to put that in dollars and cents, has a net worth of somewhere in the neighborhood of $396,200, whereas a non-homeowner may have a net worth of somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,400. So again, the conversation about home ownership spans beyond just the American dream. We have many uh, instances of just general quality of life improved as a result. So let's talk about applicant eligibility for this program. So this program is designed to help people who are either renting or homeowners in one of the impacted counties in 2018 or 2020. Again, for Santa Cruz, it would be 2020, but they're low to moderate income earners. And again, the assistance itself is supposed to close the gap between what the homeowner can afford or the home buyer can afford and the cost of property in that area. So there's 10 eligible properties or counties rather in total. And uh, basically what needs to happen is that the home buyer has to have lived in a high or very high risk area for wildfire in Santa Cruz County. They don't own any real estate at the time of their application for this program. And again, they're in that low to moderate income threshold. And we have a color key here to kind of just demonstrate the eligible counties and the colors represent which years they're eligible. And so if you have neighbors or friends, family members, et cetera, that are residing in other counties now that may be eligible because they lived in Santa Cruz or maybe even one of these other counties in another year, I encourage you to share the information about this program. But as we can see here, with uh, Santa Cruz County highlighted in this Kelly green color, it corresponds to the 2020 eligible year. So let's talk about the HBA structure in terms. And HBA again stands for Home Buyer Assistance, and it provides up to $350,000 in assistance for home purchase, okay? So we're not talking about rebuilding, but we are talking about establishing new home ownership outside of a high risk area. And so the $350,000 will be provided as a forgivable second mortgage. And that forgivable second mortgage has a five year term and 0% interest. It's also deferred, so there's no monthly payments and no interest will accrue on that second. After five years of the home buyer living in that property, the assistance will be entirely forgiven. And it's not all or nothing. There's actually a 20% deep forgiveness rate of the assistance every year that the home buyer occupies that home. So by the time they get to the five year mark, the entire amount they receive will be forgiven. It also substantially increases their equity position on the home as well. I do wanna point out that if they decide to vacate the property for whatever reason during that five year term, there could be a recall of any unforgiven portion of the assistance. 
but what was forgiven is already done. It's already in the past. It's been forgiven. And so the assistance and how it can be applied. Again, I've mentioned again and again that the overall purpose of the assistance is to bridge the affordability gap. And so with that, we're using the assistance for down payment, closing costs, including prepaids, and any ordinary customary expense that is applied to purchasing a home. And then also home buyer education fees. We want home owners, home buyers to be equipped with the knowledge and information they need to have sustainable home ownership. So there is a required home buyer education course with this program that the assistance from the program can and will cover. So here's a general overview. This is a very high level overview of what the process will look like overall. So first and foremost, the home buyer is gonna connect with one of our participating lenders. We have a network of participating lenders that have been educated and trained on the program. And so they're designed to connect with our home buyer population to determine their eligibility for the program. So first they're gonna determine the home buyer's eligibility. Then they're going to determine how much of a home loan the home buyer can afford without the assistance, right? So let's say there's no assistance at all. We just want to know how much can you afford on your own. From there, the lender is going to estimate the amount of assistance the home buyer qualifies for, and then they can start searching for a property. They're in a position now because they have their financing pre-qualified, they've got their assistance lined up, so now they're in a position to submit a credible offer to a seller. From there, the lender will reserve the funds for the borrower after they get into contract on a property. They're gonna reserve the funds as well as lock in the interest rate on the first mortgage, and then the home buyer education course will be completed, and after that, they can go ahead and close escrow. So this is an example of how this is assistance is supposed to work. Let's say you have an individual or family that can only afford a $268,000 home loan, but the cost of real estate in their area or wherever they're looking is $600,000. So this is where the assistance comes in, okay? Again, it's positioned here in the middle to illustrate the bridge between what they can afford and the cost of the home. So from that $350,000, $332,000 is going to close that gap, right? It's going to serve for the down payment as well as position the borrower to have additional funds of over up to $18,000 left for closing costs. And I realize that 600000 may be a bargain in Santa Cruz County. And I also want to point out that while you do have to have been a resident in Santa Cruz County in 2020 in a high-risk area for wildfires in order to qualify, you do have the freedom to purchase wherever you'd like, as long as it's outside of a high-risk area. So calculating the assistance, okay? So it's a pretty straightforward calculation. What the lender is going to do is they're going to take the purchase price or appraised value of the property, and they're going to subtract the max home mortgage loan amount, the first mortgage loan amount that the home buyer can afford. From there, they're going to add the closing costs and prepaids, and then they're going to subtract the greater of the duplication of benefits or liquid assets over 100000 whichever is, again, greater. And then from there, they will have the amount of assistance that the home buyer qualifies for. This is a need-based program. And before we move forward, I just wanted to define what duplication of benefits is. Duplication of benefits is essentially assistance the home buyer received from another source for housing relief for the same disaster. So let's say in 2020, you got you know $100,000 from FEMA for housing replacement or housing relief, and you have $10,000 left of that money today. And let's also say you have $120,000 in your checking account. We're not talking about retirement or you know, 401ks or anything like that. This is liquid assets. So if you have $120,000 in liquid assets, we only care about the $20,000 because that's the amount that's over one hundred. dollars So the $20,000 is greater than the $10,000 you have left over from FEMA. So the $20,000 would be the portion that, as the home buyer, you would be required to put into into the transaction. So the first mortgage guidelines. So we set the interest rates on the first mortgage for the loan. So what that means is that 
Again, affordability is the central theme to all of our work that we do here at GSFA. So it's going to be an affordable interest rate. It'll have a 30-year fixed rate term. We have FHA, VA, and USDA loans available for government, which also includes HUD 184 loans, which are designed for federally recognized tribe members who want to purchase a home in tribal lands. And then we have conventional financing available as well. The loan limit for the program is 766550 or the loan limit for the county and loan type, whichever is less. Even though we do have a loan limit, we do not have a purchase price limit. Income limits are going to be set by HUD's standards, and it's going to be based on household income, so how many people will be occupying the home that's going to be purchased, how many adults 18 or over earn income that's stable and consistent, and then the county where the home is being purchased. So we have a link here, and I know we're probably running a little short on time, so I won't uh, take you to that information, but basically this link will uh, take you to HUD's website where you can look up the income limits for various counties in California, and we're focusing on the low to moderate 80% AMI figure. The minimum credit score for the program is 640, and then we have a debt-to-income ratio. And for those of you who are not familiar with what the debt-to-income ratio is, that's simply the metric the lender uses to measure your income against your debts and help determine how much of a home loan you can afford. And because this is a need-based program, we do have a minimum debt-to-income ratio of 42% to ensure that the max home loan the home buyer can afford is being provided. And then we also have a maximum debt-to-income ratio of 45% to ensure that whatever home loan they're provided is actually sustainable long term. As I mentioned before, home buyer education is also a requirement of the program. Again, we want this to be a long term security uh, investment for the home buyer. So, again, we want to equip them with the tools and information they need to, to acquire that. And so, at least one home buyer on the application needs to complete an eight hour home buyer education course, which includes a one-on-one -on -one consultation. And again, we've negotiated a price for that course, which can be covered by the assistance from the program. So eligible properties, this is for owner-occupied properties only, which means you'll live there as your primary residence. It's for single family homes, which include properties that may have an ADU on it. Also agency approved condos, townhomes, PUDs, and manufactured homes. HUD, again, the origin of these funds comes from HUD, so we're following their standards on the size of the home based on the size of the family. So, for example, if you're a single person using the program, no one else is going to live in the home with you, then the minimum number of bedrooms you can have is one, and the maximum number of bedrooms is two. And obviously, this number increases as the number of people who will occupy the home increases. The home must also be located outside of a high risk area for wildfire. And we have this link here that basically helps us determine, helps the lender determine the eligibility for both the original property that was occupied in 2020 versus the property that you're purchasing through the program. And so this link has two functions. It's provided by Cal Fire. The first function, again, is to determine that the original property in 2020 was in fact located in a high risk area for wildfire and that the new property is not located in a high-risk area for wildfire. The new property also needs to be insurable by a traditional homeowner's insurance policy. I know a lot of people are, have experienced exorbitant rates or just complete bailout from insurance companies. And so, again, we're talking about long-term stable homeownership here. So we want to position you to be in a property that can be insured by traditional insurance. So California Fair Plan policies will not be allowed, nor will their companion policies. So how to get started, it's pretty simple. We have a list of participating lenders specific to Recover California listed on our website, and they've all been approved by GSFA. They've been trained on the program, so they have an understanding of it. They're gonna basically explain the entire program to you as a home buyer and help you understand the guidelines, the requirements, help you qualify, et cetera. 
You're also going to be able to calculate how much assistance you'll get from the program so you have a clear understanding of what that'll be and how much funding you have to work with. Not only will they process your application for the assistance, they're also going to provide you with the home loan that you need for the first mortgage. And so essentially there's not going to be any direct contact or involvement you'll have with GSFA. And this is a very important program, right? We want to reach people who need it the most. That being said, we do have a comprehensive marketing and outreach campaign that we have launched. And through our lender and realtor outreach, we're providing online training as well as in-person trainings, education at local realtor associations, as well as video and social media content. For home buyers, we are conducting uh, town hall style meetings in all 10 counties that are eligible for the program. We are emphasizing equity, inclusion, as well as underserved communities. People who may not even realize these kind of programs exist could now have an opportunity to access home ownership. So with that said, we're putting the information in the newspaper, radio advertising, media coverages, as well as uh, social media and again those live events that we'll be holding uh, throughout every county for the remainder of the year. So we do have a uh, home buyer workshop coming up for Santa Cruz County. Uh, it's tentatively scheduled for November. Uh, first, we haven't locked in that date just yet, but we will be running ads soon on um, uh, the radio as well as social media and newspapers. So keep an eye out for that. You're also welcome to reach out to us directly here at GSFA to provide you with more information on the upcoming events as well as information on the program. So with that, I'll go ahead and end here. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it is exceptionally helpful. And I think that Quite frankly, we, we weren't aware of all these opportunities and, and um, I can see one of my colleagues potentially taking you up on one of the town hall type presentations within their district because of uh, I'm confident that that we could do more in outreach, but um, I'll hand it back to you, Chair. Great, thank you. Um, what I'll do is maybe I'll open it up to see if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item. And so we'll start with people who are here in the room. If you'd like to speak on this item, please approach the podium. Seeing none, we'll go online to see if there's any member of the public online who'd like to speak to us on this item. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we do have speakers online. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. <laughs> Call in user one, as a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Chair, we have no further speakers. It seems the caller is unable to connect. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board then to see if there's any questions from board members. No questions, thank you. Just uh, appreciation for the presentation and uh, for Supervisor Friend for bringing it to us. Um, yeah, I'd just like to thank um, Supervisor Friend for bringing this to our attention. It's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, one thing that I would like to um, recognize also here was we've done some good things uh the planning department the recovery group we've tried to move things along as quickly as we can and also uh i'd like to recognize the work of our office of response recovery and resilience um and ask dave uh, reed who is the director to address the board of any specific points that we should address maybe in this regard um i, I he knew i was going to be asking him to come up because i think how it applies to us directly uh how he sees this would be welcome Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we're really excited about this opportunity. I think what's unique about this program, as um, Ms. Harris mentioned, was that it's available to renters. So we know that a lot of renters that were impacted by the fire drifted into the, the rental market without the support they need. So we're excited to work um, with Ms. Harris and all of your offices to get the message out to community about this opportunity. All right. Good. Supervisor so, Hernandez, do you have any questions, comments? I did have a, a couple um, questions 
I, I guess the first is I'm just wondering how long the application period is open. I know that, you know, given that it opened in June and we can, we can have some local presentations here in November. I'm just wondering how long that application period is going to be open for. Yeah, that's a great question, Mr. Chair. So the uh, application period is basically available as long as the funding is. We were allocated $28 million for the program. And so far, if we were to, to divide that 350 per, you know, uh, person, which not every family is going to need or qualify for a 350, but that would be 80 applications. Right now we have, uh, I believe, 30 applications and not all of them have funding reserved because there are different phases of the application stage. But basically um, there's a 60 day lock period, which is how long the interest rate is good for when someone purchases a home. And the interest rate lock period doesn't begin until they make it through the first two phases of the process. And the first two phases are designed to make sure the applicant is actually eligible for the program and to give an accurate um, figure for what and how much assistance they qualify for. So I would say it really depends. It's a combination of the lending team and their efficiency, the cooperation of the home buyer and their you know, willingness and ability to provide documentation as requested in a timely manner. And then of course, GSFA, we have our due diligence and our process on our end. But again, you know, overall, this shouldn't take more than it ordinarily does in terms of the timeline in purchasing a home. If anyone's ever purchased a home, Aside from the property search, once you're actually in escrow, it typically happens within, you know, 30 to 60 days. Great. And then one other question. So help me better understand this too. So if somebody owned a home that was was burned in the fire, and let's say they were underinsured and weren't able to rebuild, would those individuals be qualified for this program? Or is it really just for people who are renting within those areas who lost their home or maybe were displaced or just lived in those areas at the time. Um, and it's kind of like encouraging them to purchase home potentially outside the high-risk fire area. Yeah, so the homeowners of that time are also eligible as long as they don't own real estate now. We have some people whose you know property was completely flat in the structure, but they still own the land. A lot of those folks are you know traumatized from the experience and they're ready to get rid of that land so they can get into the program. What I'm recommending for people who still own homes but they want to move out of a high risk area is to get with one of our participating lenders to weigh the pros and cons of the program versus your current situation so you can actually you know determine what's going to be the best option before you liquidate your property. Uh, I also want to point out that um, in addition to renters and homeowners, we have people who were kids at the time, like high school students that are also in a position to use this program, even though they didn't pay rent, they lived at home, uh, they're able to use this program because they lived in a high risk area. So we're now offering the opportunity for kids, again, you know, college age folks to become homeowners at a very young age. So I think this is a great opportunity for anybody who who's eligible and can take advantage of it. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I would definitely want to follow up with you to see if we can have a meeting with um, some folks in my area who are impacted by the fires. Um, and if there's no Further questions from board members, just really want to appreciate you taking the time to introduce this program to our community, and we'll be happy to share out the information that you've provided today with the broader community so that we can make sure that people can take advantage of this program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, we'll move on to our next item, which is item number nine, hold a public hearing to consider application 231069, 20 21 unit subdivision located at 1960 Maciel Avenue determined that the proposal is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to public resources code section 21083.3 and SQL guideline section 15183 and take related actions. And with that, I will turn it over to our staff from community development and infrastructure. Good morning, Chair, members of the board, Jonathan DeSalvo, Planning Division staff. The item before you is a proposal to subdivide one existing parcel of 2.3 acres into 21 lots. 
with the common area lot for access, parking, and landscape, and to construct 21 detached homes. This project requires approval of a subdivision, residential development permit with density bonus, and a roadway roadside exception, and preliminary grading review. Project site is located at 1960 Mossiel Avenue in the Live Oak planning area. Subject parcel fronts on the east side of Mossiel Avenue, approximately 300 feet south of Madison Lane and 300 feet north of Encina Drive. Surrounding neighborhoods are predominantly residential in use. The surrounding pattern of development consists of single family residential uses. As indicated here, there is an in process application for 25 Unit Residential Development Application Number 221077, proposed on four contiguous lots adjacent to and to the east of the project site. Rodeo Gulch Creek is located about 300 feet east to, uh, of the site. The subject property is located in the SU-D or Special Use Designated Park Site Combining District. The special use zone district allows single family residential uses such as that proposed when consistent with the parcel's general plan designation. In this case, the general plan designation is RUL, which allows residential uses, and the zoning is consistent with the general plan designation. So the project site is in a designated park site combining district. Park site review has been waived by the county parks department. The parks department has determined that they would not be interested in acquiring the parcel for future park or open space purposes. As mentioned before, the project site and surrounding properties are located within the RUL or Urban Low Density Residential General Plan designation. The proposed project would result in a development which is consistent with the uses and density permitted within the zone district and the general plan designation. So the following slides are a few photos of the project site. This photo looking south shows the project site to the east of Mossiel Avenue. The site is developed with an existing home and outbuildings, which were constructed in 1921 and are in dilapidated condition. A historic evaluation concluded that the project is not eligible for listing as a historic resource. Here's another view of the project site looking east. And here we see the surrounding context of the project site on the right. This slide shows a zoomed in perspective of the tentative map. As you can see, this project would subdivide the property into 21 lots with a common area lot for access, parking, drainage, and utility improvements and landscaping. The common area lot is indicated on this slide with a purple border. The project also includes an offer for a 30 foot wide street dedication across its fronted for off site streetscape improvements indicated here uh, with a yellow border. Building envelopes for each story of each building are indicated on the respective lots. The buildings would conform to the dimension building envelopes as indicated on the tentative map. This slide shows building envelopes for the first story of all units. And here are the building envelopes for the second story of all units. Vehicle access to the new residences will group be provided from two new entry access points connecting to Masiel Avenue on a U-shaped interior roadway through the site. Proposed off-site improvements include sidewalks, curbs, and gutters along the project frontage uh, within the 35-foot 30, wide dedication. Parking areas and attached garages for each unit are proposed to be accessed via the 20-foot wide interior roadway. A four-foot wide pedestrian sidewalk with a curb is produced is proposed along one side of the, of the internal roadway. The sidewalk uh, is proposed along the northern sides of the roadway, allowing for appropriate uh, drainage improvements along the southern side of the roadway via a three-foot wide valley gutter. Proposed sidewalks are indicated on the slide in blue, and the valley gutter is indicated in yellow. Uh, con continuous pedestrian circulation will be provided within the project site and to the new sidewalks on Mossiel Avenue. As indicated by the green box, the loop roadway has been designed to accommodate six additional unassigned guest parking spaces located at the eastern edge of the loop. Emergency vehicle access or EVA egress point with removable bollards is provided at the eastern property line connecting to the adjacent property to the east for which a proposed in-process subdivision has been proposed. 
per general plan policy BE 4.1.8, future shared use between adjacent developments is encouraged where appropriate. And the proposed EVA is a demonstrated effort to coordinate site design with an adjacent property or any future development of the adjacent property. Provision of the EVA will result in efficient emergency vehicle access as well as bicycle and pedestrian circulation through both properties from Masiel Avenue to the west to Madison Lane to the northeast. The project will provide 76 spaces in individual garages and driveways and six guest parking spaces. Additionally, 10 new public on-street parking spaces will be provided along the project frontage on Mossel Avenue. The project meets and exceeds the parking requirement. A bicycle repair station would also be installed in a common area of the project site to encourage bicycling by residents. New landscaping will be planted throughout the project site, including a mix of trees, shrubs, perennial grasses, and ground covers. Trees will be planted along the Masio Avenue streetscape, and a row of evergreen screen plantings would be provided along the eastern site boundary. Wood fencing would wrap private yards for each lot. Areas for placement of trash and, re and recycling receptacles would be located in the side yards of each lot screened behind fencing. The project site slopes down from Mossville Avenue and the proposed design of the subdivision would result in the lots graded to work with the existing topography, minimizing retaining walls and earthwork. All buildings would meet the 28 foot height limit. The location of the three on-site affordable units, uh, which meet code requirements and were reviewed and uh, approved by housing division staff are indicated by the red circles. The proposed two-story homes would range from 1,670 square feet to 2,330 square feet in size and would include rooftop solar panels. There are six different home designs or plan types, all containing three bedrooms. The materials and colors of the homes would include composition shingle roof, uh, roofs uh, and lap shingle stucco and board and batten siding, incorporating a variation of neutral tones. The project is eligible for 40% density bonus to allow for the development of 24 residential units in exchange for the provision of three affordable units. The total number of units allowed is calculated based on the number of base units allowed subject to the site's zoning and general plan designation. As noted in the staff report, the application was deemed complete in 2023, predating the sustainability update becoming effective on March 15, 2024. Under the updated general plan and county code, a higher density would be allowed on the project site than currently proposed. Though a higher density could be sought at the project site and the applicant is not precluded from seeking a higher density, the applicant has elected to proceed with the original density bonus project of 21 units as designed for this project. The proposed density is also in conformance with the current general plan density range. The affordable units are included as part of the proposed development and will be regulated and are restricted to income limits subject to a recorded affordable housing and density bonus agreement. The remaining 18 units will be available as market rate units. Density bonus law allows applicants to request waivers of any development standards that have the effect of physically precluding the development of a, uh, the construction of a housing development. As detailed on sheet ZT of the project plans, the applicant is requesting several waivers for this project. These are one, to allow for encroachments into setbacks, two, increase, increases in allowed lot coverage, three, increases in allowed floor area ratio or FAR, and four, allowance, allowances to create parcels below the minimum required lot width. Granting these waivers would allow the project as designed to provide three bedroom units containing sufficient parking and open, open space, along with the necessary site improvements, such as safe and efficient multimodal access and circulation through the project site. Three bedroom homes are an attractive housing type for families and the design of the small lot subdivision would be compatible with the housing types encouraged by the general plan, the surrounding neighborhood context and density bonus law. The project has been reviewed for compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA pursuant to public resources code or PRC section 21083.3. This section provides for streamlined environmental review or exemption for projects consistent with the general plan for which an EIR was certified. An environmental checklist for determination of CEQA exemption was prepared and is on file with the department and links, uh, was linked to the planning commission meeting agenda. The purpose of the checklist was to evaluate the impact categories covered in the county certified sustainability update EIR to determine whether the project's impacts would have been adequately analyzed in that EIR 
or that any new significant impacts particular to the project or project site would result. As explained in the environmental checklist, the county concludes that the project does not create any impacts that were peculiar to the project site or parcel and is thus fully exempt from CEQA under PRC section 21083.3 and CEQA guidelines section 15183. Thus, no further environmental analysis is required. At its meeting on June 26, 2024, the Planning Commission voted unanimously to recommend that the Board of Supervisors approve the application for resolution number 2024-01. Several conditions were added by the Planning Commission, including an allowance for minor projections beyond building envelopes, a requirement that guest parking signage be added, and a requirement that bat boxes be installed on the project site. To date, since the Planning Commission meeting, one letter in opposition to the project citing drainage concerns was submitted to your board for review. No other public correspondence has been received. As proposed and conditioned, the project is consistent with all applicable codes and policies of the zoning ordinance and general plan. Staff therefore recommends that your board determine that the project is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and approve application number 231069 based on planning commission resolution number 2024-1 and the findings and conditions attached to the planning commission staff report. This concludes my presentation. Staff is available for any questions. Um, also, the applicant team is in attendance and has uh, prepared a short presentation. All right, thank you very much. And I think at this time what we'll do is we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. And so I guess at this point, what we want to hear from the applicant then. Yeah, that's fine. So I'm like the applicant up to uh, provide. How much time are you going to need? A couple minutes, okay. Now, yes. Good morning. Morning. Hi. Good morning. Um, Dan Hale with Hale Jones Architects. I'm also here with the civil engineer and ownership. I'd like to thank Mr. DeSalvo for the thorough presentation, and also kind of shepherding our design team for the last couple of years to get to this point. Uh, we are very excited to have 21 single-family detached homes proposed in front of you three of which, as mentioned, will be affordable. Uh, we have parking that exceeds the minimum. All the homes uh, we feel are what people are seeking in that area of town. They're family homes, they're three bedrooms, they have a backyard, they have a two-car garage, they have a driveway apron. Uh, we are doing improvements to Maciel Avenue. I spoke, I, I believe I said that correct this time. And as mentioned, the EVA access also provides pedestrian bicycle circulation to the property to the east that ultimately will connect to a future trail extension. So we're happy to have this in front of you today. We are here to listen to your comments, answer questions, but ultimately ask for your approval so we can move forward on the next next steps. So thank you. Thank you very much. So any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item who's here in chambers today, if so, please approach the podium. You'll be given two minutes. I thank you, um, board, for your members of the board for your public service. Uh, my name is Shane Pavanetti. I'm a local architect, as well as a neighbor directly to the north of the subject property. Um, my uh, my reason for speaking today has to do with the um, the several waivers that have been approved by the planning commission. Uh, this gentleman. Uh, quickly ran through some of those. Um, there was also a statement that said that this project uh, meets the zoning code um, and should be approved by the board. That is categorically incorrect. Um, this project has requested uh, several waivers. Um, and as an architect, I know personally that these waivers are something that when we work with single family homeowners are extremely difficult to get. And it seems like the planning commission grazed over these and they were all approved without what I think is a due consideration. Um, encroachments into setbacks, increased allowed lot coverage, increased in allowable floor area ratio, and allowances uh, for minimum required lot width. These are some of the, I would say, most elemental parts of the zoning code. And I don't see why these would all need to be granted for the quote, uh, it, 
to have the effect of, quote, physically precluding the construction of a housing development. In my opinion, we work very hard with single homeowners um, to help them fit the project that they're looking for within these rules and within the zoning code. I encourage the board to send this back to the Planning Commission to ask why they feel that these uh, were allowed, uh, because I don't see how they physically preclude the construction of a housing development. And it's something that I feel like has been given favor to a larger development when we have a very difficult time with these kinds of uh, breaking of the zoning code. So I recommend that this go back to the Planning Commission to review why those were easily allowed. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Cummins, board. Thank you very much for hearing us. My name is Carl Washburn. I live right downstream from the project. I am not speaking in opposition to the project. We need homes. I'm speaking about the safety of our property due to their drainage plan. I'm very disappointed that the planner and the planning commission did not take in earnest our concerns. Their stormwater plan has drainage through our property during an extreme storm or when their drainage system fails. They have mentioned that we have not um, met with them to discuss this. We have not met with them. We said we simply want their data for an extreme storm and their plans on how they connect to us, and they have not provided those. I am requesting you send this back to the Planning Commission for them to obtain a real easement. They claim they have one at the point one hour and seven minutes in the oral presentation before the uh, or the planning commission, their applicant stated they have an easement. What they have in their hand is a agreement between us and the County Department of Public Works that states we will maintain a drainage, a drainage conduit for the water we're currently receiving. It doesn't mention anything about a development or water coming from a piece of property that has seven times the impervious area that the current property does. So please send it back. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Vicki Janai, and I live on La Ciel Avenue across from the proposed development. I was speaking um, on behalf of myself and my family. And, you know, we know that so we're not aiming to stop any progress. We do ask that the board consider some of the concerns that have been brought forth by the neighbors previously. Um, one of the main concerns is traffic. And during the last meeting with the Planning Commission, the commission chair questioned the ability of the traffic study, but in the end, they did not require additional studies. Um, the report stated that the project is expected to generate about 189 net new daily trips with 14 morning peak hour trips, four in, 10 out, and 19 evening peak hour trips, 12 in and seven out, the county requires a formal traffic import analysis, impact analysis if the project generates 20 or more morning or evening peak hour vehicle trips. However, as indicated in the uh, provided transportation analysis, the project generates 20 peak hour trips, less than. Therefore, they did not require uh, further analysis. Um, however, Looking at 21 houses with four parking spaces each, the calculations for cars going in and out during morning and evening peak hours seems awfully low to us. Even if only one car per household came and went during these hours, it would be over the threshold of 20. Um, additionally, the project will connect to the other proposed development that was mentioned here earlier for the 24 or 25 new houses. The current plan states, that this will be used for emergency vehicle access only. Can we ensure that that will be the case in the future or will that become also a road onto Maciel? Ma'am, your time's up, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, uh, Chairman Cummings, Board of Supervisors. My name is Marcus Hutnack. I live on Madison Lane. It's very close to the subject property. I'm here as a supporter of housing for Santa Cruz, but also as a defender of our neighborhood. And this project has more waivers, exceptions, exemptions than you can shake a stick at. There are dozens of them. And the architect, who's a professional in this industry, testified to that. This, uh, again, the need for housing, supportive. But the project needs to go back to the county development so that they can review this and eliminate these exceptions. And why would I suggest that? Because I am part of the, the community that is trying to improve housing in Santa Cruz County. And how did I do that? I built an ADU in advance of all of the new legislation. So this was actually under the old rules. And I had every single rule, uh, process, requirement, and I adhered to those. And in fact, the good folks at the county uh, planning division, they said, Marcus, we can't give you an exemption on a setback because if we did it for you, we'd have to do it for everyone. And this is why I'm testifying today. The rules are the rules and the exemptions and waivers that this applicant has submitted are extreme in their nature. And I would ask the count, the supervisors, to remand this back to planning and let them meet with us and most importantly, adhere to the rules as they are currently construed. And I thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I support everything the residents have asked you to do. Um, please send it back to the Planning Commission, examine why all of these waivers were granted, and to do a traffic study. One thing that we all um, that are we all are experiencing in our neighborhoods is a, a steep increase in the number of um, online delivery service vehicles, and that has to be yeah, calculated into this. So please send it back to the Planning Commission. In reviewing and looking at the the project map, what what came to my mind was this area was once a very active um, poultry farm. Santa Cruz County was number two in the state for small poultry farms. Has there been any analysis of the soils to see if there are contaminants there? That became a huge problem for the project of 1500 Capitola Road for a different reason, but still there were um, serious carcinogens found in that soil. So I would like to know about that issue. I also did not see any accommodation to the point of the drainage about keeping the stormwater uh, runoff on site, which is what the county requires. There's no provision for that, at least in the designs. I also um, would like to see more, um, see community gardens built into this because that is a very important part of a community like this and honors the agricultural past uses of the history of the, the property. I want to know if the road width will accommodate on street parking and still allow uh, emergency vehicles to pass through safely. And finally, I request that there be a requirement for solar and microgrid electricity in keeping with the county's policies. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there any other person here in chambers who'd like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, I'd like to see if there's anybody online who'd like to speak to us on this item. Yes, Chair, we have speakers online. <laughs> Call in user one, your microphone's now available. Hi, Marilyn Garrett, and I also support sending this back to the Planning Commission and adhering to the recommendations of the neighbors, kind of shocking approval by the Planning Commission of this project. I hope the board will listen to the neighbors and prioritize them instead of large developments like I see you have done regularly. Um, 
you stated that the parks were not interested in having this uh, park area. Did you consult with the neighbors and everybody in the area who would like to see a park? It seems like we need many more areas where children can play. In terms of three affordable units, what I see labeled as affordable isn't really affordable to many. At the same time, homeless people are having their encampments destroyed, putting more people in dire situations. The cruelty of it is just uh, astounding, and I think some of them are fire victims you spoke of earlier. Um, the waivers don't sound like they should be given at all. CEQA exemption, that's a false check off of an exemption to CEQA from what I've just heard of people. I urge a, um, a no vote on this. And what one of the neighbors said that there are more waivers and exemptions and he's seen it's extreme in their nature. Why? Please support everything the neighbors have recommended. Vote this down back to the planning commission. I find this very uh, biased in favor of big development. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Thank you. Charles, your microphone's now available. Okay, uh, good morning and thanks for listening. I'd like to go back to the uh, traffic issue. Um, we found the report on traffic, at the, which was presented at the Planning Commission, to be risible, uh, just incomprehensible, that if you have 21 units, that you're only going to have uh, 14 uh, peak morning hours, and then conveniently only 19 in the evening, just conveniently one under 20, which is the threshold for further study. Well, I went online and I discovered that 1.92 is the expected number of vehicles, almost two vehicles per uh, unit in the state of California. And that's true here. The current property at 1960 Maciel Avenue has five vehicles uh, on the property. So to think that there's only, to calculate only one vehicle per property to do a traffic study makes no sense whatsoever. Second of all, they only calculated for the D'Amico property, 1960, they didn't calculate the number of vehicles that will be on the Antonelli property, which is uh, also uh, under consideration, which should almost double the traffic. Therefore, there must be a complete new traffic study, taking all these things into account, plus safety. So I also want to remind everybody that we are, have put in for traffic bumps, traffic homes. We want the safety that they installed over there on Claire's. It's so nice, that traffic table. We'd like one of those, or at least like they have on Madison Avenue every, every uh, 40 yards or so they have those bumps. The safety here is, I, I watch this every day. It's very dangerous. I'm surprised we haven't had a fatality. Uh, thanks for listening. Please uh, take the recommendation to send this back to the Planning Commission and put a star next to complete, accurate, and reasonable traffic study. Thank you. Good day to all. S. Salyer, your microphone's now available. Hi, good day. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for having me. So my wife and I met in 1977 in a physics class at Cabrillo College. We got married and we bought our home here on Maciel. And we live right across the street from this proposed development. And I really support the need for housing. It's obscene that our law enforcement, fire personnel, medical personnel, teachers, you know, struggle to find housing in this community. Shame on us. But, you know, we bought our home with our 6,000. We've tried to do ADUs, as all of my other neighbors have echoed here. Um, it's play by the rules. And we were not allowed uh, 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 special setbacks. So, uh, and, and now we see that a big developer from out of county comes in and gets multiple waivers and exceptions. And I just, 
you know, <laughs> Bruce, Manu, I've worked on your campaigns. We support you guys, but we look to your leadership. You guys are stewards for our neighborhoods, our values. Um, it's absurd to think that with 21 units is only going to produce the number of trips that the, tra the traffic analysis described. Um, I see two and three cars in everybody's driveway these days. It's a very narrow 18 foot wide street. It's unsafe for us to walk, to walk our dogs on our street. We use the back streets. Um, I'm stunned that there was the CEQA was waived. It's a repairing corridor, the Rodale, uh, Rodale Creek. It's a raptors live there, nest there, hawks and owls. Um, I would really ask that, that uh, the good folks on the Board of Supervisors send this back to planning for a closer evaluation. That's all I have. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. <laughs> Okay, well, I just want to thank everyone for the comments on this item, and I'd like to bring it back to staff to see if you could uh, respond to some of the concerns that were raised during the comment period. Um, it sounds like there's a lot around uh, traffic study, drainage, and, and the, the number of waivers and exceptions that were allowed uh, for this development. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. Uh, yeah, so it may be difficult to summarize, uh, perhaps or address everything, but um, uh, this, uh, as far as the the waivers being requested um they are it's their their right to request waivers with a density bonus project so a density bonus project means that they are providing some percentage of affordable housing um and as such they can request these waivers that again would um uh pr preclude the, the construction of those uh units uh, as i referenced in my in my presentation, sheet ZT of the um, the plan set uh, kind of goes through these uh, requested waivers from uh, all of the, the setbacks. And you can see, for the most part, they're pretty minor. There's a foot here. There's uh, uh, generally, there's just minor kind of uh, uh, um, wa waivers to site standards, again, to fit this number, this density of, of development uh, in that that zone district uh, or on that parcel so uh, they're proposing 21 units uh, under the uh, under the, the when they were deemed complete they could still go to 24 um, so they're providing less units than they're eligible for um, as far as a, a density bonus project and then with the change to the general plan under the sustainability update um, they would be able to go to about uh, 32 units with um the similar percentage of, affor of affordability that they would be providing so um waivers are are to cater uh uh density bonus projects and this is small lot subdivision and, and in line with um what uh the the code uh, allows for there um, as far as the traffic study that was reviewed by uh, the traffic engineering staff with the department of, of, of public works um, and that analysis w was um, accepted by them. So I, you know, defer uh, to to their to the experts there, um, and that that analysis was was accepted. Are there any other uh, specific questions? Um, not currently for me, but it looks like we also have our director of CDI, Pam so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. All right, thank you, Chair and Supervisor. Just going to provide a little support to Jonathan here on the traffic. Uh, just uh, what we heard on the commentary there was about the need for a traffic study. And I can tell you, even if the numbers are, I mean, you could, everybody could figure out one or two plus or minus, a traffic study will not indicate any changes to this development project. This project is on Maciel, which has more than adequate capacity. A two lane road has significant capacity. And so the numbers we're talking about are, I don't want to say insignificant, but they're very low. And so, and so a traffic report will not give us any new information to do any sort of additional improvements to this area. And so um, I think it's, it's well warranted the way the project was submitted. Um, we believe that, that they've addressed all the concerns, you know, with sidewalks and with adequate access to MACL and the capacity is absolutely there. Uh, whether you want to argue over an additional trip here or there, it won't make a difference. So I just want to assure you that that uh, the proposed plan is a good plan. 
uh, that there is capacity in the neighborhood to address the generation that's going to happen from the from the 21 homes, uh, and that you know, as with every neighborhood, uh, we look at striping and signage and and maybe even speed bumps in the future, and those are things that we do everywhere, uh, independent of these types of projects. So I do think we have enough tools in our toolbox to create a very safe environment. And there's definitely capacity in this in this area of the community and certainly housing is needed as everybody's already shared. So happy to answer any questions, but I did want to address the, the comment about potentially needing a traffic report, which we do not believe we need a traffic report for this. And the last comment, maybe we'll see which yeah. one of you maybe can answer this, but there was the drainage issue that was brought up um, by a member of the public. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak to that as well. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the project as proposed has been reviewed by uh, the stormwater management staff of the section of uh, public works uh, and as proposed meets all requirements. So um, checking in with them again, they confirm that approval of the tentative map is is uh, not contingent on establishment of uh, an easement on uh, the adjacent property uh, to the south um, that uh, as as proposed, it meets meets all their requirements and, and California um, drainage law. Thank you. Thank you. All right. With that, I'll open it up to members of the board to see if there's any questions or comments on this item. And I'll start to my left to see if Supervisor McPherson, you have any questions or comments on this item? Or to Supervisor Cornyn. Just a few questions, kind of following up on on some of the questions from the public. Uh, so, emergency vehicles that's been looked at already through both roads or the U shaped road. Yeah. So the project, as proposed, even if the adjacent property is never developed in in itself, the project meets all uh, fire access uh, standards. Um, but uh, providing that EVA access allows for that opportunity when the adjacent property develops um, to. Uh, to allow for uh, optimal uh, uh, emergency vehicle circulation. Uh, and it would be closed to through uh, vehicular traffic. Um, there's emergency ballers that go across that uh, entry. And then during the presentation, the applicant mentioned about um, improvements on Massiel. And um, right now during the presentation from our CDI director, uh, Matt Machado, he mentioned about um, sidewalks. Is that the improvements on Massiel that, that the applicant was talking about? Or is there additional pedestrian safety infrastructure that's being done on Massiel? So the, as far as the offsite uh, uh, improvements that the project is providing um, within that 30 foot wide ded uh, street ride dedication, they're providing uh, sidewalks, curb and gutter, uh, along with those uh, about 10 additional on street parking spaces and room for those uh, parking spaces. Um, but as far as the, the, the infrastructure or improvements that they are that they're developing, it's just along uh, the pro project frontage there and not elsewhere along the seal. To us, friend, any questions, comments? I just have, I have just brief comments. I mean, I, I drove by the project site. I've been through there before because I actually uh, knew somebody who used to live a couple doors down on a, on a small single family there. But, you know, closer to Cap Road there, I mean, at the end of the day, this exact type of development already exists on that exact same side of the street with the, I mean, basically the exact same number of units um, leading from Cap Road almost to this development. I mean, this fits in with the character of the neighborhood as it's uh, at least been envisioned post redevelopment. I mean, there's been some changes in that area. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense. It also, quite frankly, isn't that large of a development in, in, in the scope of what large developments are now looking to be in both uh, Santa Cruz County and throughout the state. It's I think it's a well-designed project uh, from a visual standpoint from the architect, and, and uh, I just think that it fits in with uh, um, with the rest of that neighborhood leading to Cap, Cap Road. So I'll, I'll be supportive. Thank you. Supervisor Koning. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I'll just preface my comments by saying uh, it's with mixed emotions that I consider this uh, application today. I mean, Maciel is a truly beautiful street, and uh, the parcels here, the one we're considering, and uh, the one that was mentioned for future development as well, uh, really escaped time uh, in preserving a rural, um, a rural feel right in the middle of uh, our urban area here in Santa Cruz County. And so, um, you know, while 
I'm, I'm sad to see it go at the same time. Uh, this is a project that is providing badly needed missing middle housing. And uh, to Supervisor Friend's point, um, you know, the project is eligible for a much larger uh, number of units. I mean, 24 even under uh, our county um, existing affordable density bonus and um, potentially even 32 under the sustainability update. Um, and I mean, I think there's even a fair argument that, that we should be building 32 because it's the smack dab in the middle of our urban area. And we're, you know, investing tens of millions of dollars in uh, infrastructure all over the place, whether it's the highway or updating the sewer line or uh, investing in more frequent bus service on Capitola Road. Um, so I really see, um, that while, while I know it's it's hard uh, to accept, I see these 21 units uh, being proposed here as is actually a middle ground between uh, preserving the neighborhood character and the, the nature of uh, the single family nature of the neighborhood uh, and just the extreme needs for housing in our community. Um, I'll speak to a few of the different elements brought up. I mean, first uh, to the safety element and to drainage. Um, Mr. Washburn, you know, take your your concerns very seriously, um, and uh, just had had an opportunity to review the um, the storm drain system uh, with the applicant. Um, and you know, when we had met, uh, your primary request was make sure the storm water is draining to Masiel Avenue. And from what I saw, of the system that's exactly what's happening. Um, so the, there is an 18 inch pipe going out to Maciel. Um, it will handle uh, the majority, if not all of the water up to a 50 year event. Um, and I mean, every system needs a, a release valve. And so some water, yes, um, in extreme events may still cross your property as it is today. Um, but there's, I mean, there's a huge number of considerations that went into the design of the system. Um, it's going to be diverting the water from uh, upstream neighboring properties to this one today. Um, it will, be, because of the improvements being made to the to the road, it will prevent a good amount of the water that's flowing downhill now onto the property from ever even uh, entering the subject property and therefore flowing onto to your property. Um, and you know, there's really, in many ways, the design has gone above and beyond, both in the size of the um, of the outflow pipe, uh, as well as with including permeable pavers throughout the project, uh, and really best choosing the location of the retention basin uh, to ensure that um, even that area is going to be the most permeable uh, area of the site as far as uh, the soil, so that uh, the water that is released from the detention basin is actually uh, draining out to uh, Rodeo Gulch. So um, I definitely invite you to to review the system uh, with the applicant. Um, you know, I came in with with your safety fully in mind and, and do feel satisfied uh, that it will be an adequate system. Um, to the uh, parking and traffic issue, um, you know, one of the I mentioned sort of the wonderful nature of uh, Masiel Avenue. One of the drawbacks is that it is being used as a cut through today, particularly to avoid all the traffic on Soquel Avenue and uh, the backups on the highway while we're experiencing construction. Um, and so, I mean, I see the real challenge, not so much with the additional trips that will be brought by this project, but by the fact that it is being used as a cut through street uh, for people who are commuting across the county. Um, and that's what I've seen consistently when visiting the street during rush hour. Um, I think that's why people are speeding through because they're going through. They're not coming home on Masiel, to Masiel Avenue. Um, so I, I am strongly supportive of uh, the neighborhood's efforts to add speed bumps. Um, I know that, I mean, this is um, that the petition has already been circulated, collected. I believe we're, we have an application that's um, actually at the top of the pile as far uh, as a public works consideration of this. Um, and I will be suggesting that we include speed bumps as a condition to approving this project because um, I think, you know, absolutely we want this to remain a neighborhood where it's people's destination and not one where people are speeding through. Um, so I think by slowing traffic on Maciel, while um, you know the, the big investments we're making on Highway One and Soquel Drive, um, even in the bus system on Capitola Road, uh, will keep people moving through the county on those major arteries. Uh, finally, to the the issue of the uh, various waivers. Um, and first of all, it's from what I'm hearing from planning staff and my own understanding of our code. Those are those waivers are. Um, acceptable based on the affordable density bonus that we have as as law in our county. And so um, at the end of the day, we can't change the rules when applications come in at the uh, to the point of approval and have gone through tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in investment and um, and many hundreds of hours of time. 
um, you know, I at the same time do hear the concern of of neighbors who have also made every effort to invest in housing through ADUs, through the development of, of well-designed single-family homes uh, of all kinds. I mean, housing of all kinds is needed. And so um, in my mind, the solution here is not to change the rules on this application, but to make sure, as was said, the same rules apply to everyone trying to build housing in our community to update uh, our code or to, to create similar opportunities to build uh, affordable housing with with additional waivers um, or I mean really we should for clarity's sake be moving away from waivers and get back to one clear set of rules that apply to everyone because I completely agree I mean the rules should be the rules for for everyone we should be facilitating everyone's investment in housing uh, and um, whether it's for for family or relatives or just to um, for, for our public sector employees or you name it. So um, that's something I'm committed to working on going forward uh, to ensure that everyone can make these investments in housing in our community. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll conclude there. Thank you. If there's, if there's no further comments, I'm prepared to move the recommended actions uh, with the additional direction that our additional condition that the developer pay for and install speed bumps in accordance with what is designed for and approved by the Department of Public Works in collaboration with the neighborhood uh, earlier this year. Second. Okay. So we have a motion by Supervisor Koenig um, with the additional direction, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez. I'll just make a couple um, comments before we move on to the vote. Um, first, I just want to appreciate everybody's work on this um, project. And I want to appreciate the public, uh, the members of the public who live within that vicinity, the neighbors who are going to be impacted by the project, um, and also the work of our planning commission to bring this to our attention. And, you know, just want to say that there's a lot of laws at the state level that are changing pretty rapidly year over year. Um, that's really, you know, meant to facilitate the, the rapid production of housing. Um, one of the concerns that I still have is that, you know, we need to be ensuring that when those waivers and concessions are being applied that we're getting more affordable housing in return because my big concern is that we're not going to get the affordable housing we need to meet our arena numbers and we're not going to get the amount of housing that we need that's actually going to meet the needs of our lower income workers people who work in many of our sectors can't afford market rate units and so to the extent that we're continuing to consider if we're making all these waivers and concessions how we can increase our inclusionary to get more affordable housing is something that i think we really need to be taking into account and so I'm hoping future boards will be exploring that. Um, and then also, um, just a side comment, I uh, really hope and encourage the, the, the developers to um, consider native plants rather than um, non-native plants and also plants that aren't going to break sidewalks. I lived previously in a unit where the street, so street trees were put in with a good intention of, you know, making the neighborhood better, but then the root systems broke apart the sidewalks and that those repairs are the responsibility of the homeowner, not the local government who put the trees in, in the first place. So I just hope that's taken into account um, so that we're not negatively impacting homeowners homeowners. And then finally, um, I really hope that um, our board, as we move forward, will really ensure that these homes are going to families. Um, I think the one, one of the things we've been seeing are, you know, homes that are going to vacation rentals or homes that are going towards, you know, second vacation homes. And really the purpose of trying to facilitate the construction of this housing is for families that are going to live and work in our community. And so I'm just hoping that we can continue to explore policies that will ensure that these the homes that are being built are going to go towards people who are going to live in them and within our community and that they're not just second bedroom homes for folks who just want to come visit or seen as investment properties for the purposes of Airbnb or other short-term rentals. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to follow the leadership of my colleague who uh, who's um, the community listens in. And I'm sorry. Thank you. I just wanted to, because the motion calls for adding a condition, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to call the applicant up and, and, and determine whether the applicant was amenable to that condition, that extra condition. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm understanding that it's fine with the applicant for the record. Thanks. All right. With that, then um, I'll end my comments there. I just want to thank everybody for coming and participating today and we'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson and Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Uh, with that, let's take maybe a quick break. Um, come back. It's 1155. We can come back at noon.
Um, we'll, we'll continue on with the rest of the items on our agenda. Recording stopped. And so we'll move on. Recording to in 10. progress. Consider Mountain Charlie Road, PM 1.63, temporary roadway project. Find that the emergency continues to exist pursuant to the public contract code sections 22050 and take related action. Uh, so four fifths vote required. And so I'll turn it over to Steve Wiesner uh, for the presentation on this item. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cummings, board members, CEO Palacios members of the public. My name is Steve Wiesner, I'm Assistant Director in our Community and Development Infrastructure Department in the Public Works Division. Um, I'm primarily in charge of our road system. And with me today here is our Director, uh, Matt Machado. I'm here to give you a brief update on the Mountain Charlie Emergency Road Construction Project. So um, as uh, most of you are aware, um, this past winter, Mount Charlie Road at this location, post mile 1.63, began moving shortly after the federally declared disaster event, which occurred uh, in late January into early February. Um, we, we discovered it just, just a short time afterwards, a couple of weeks, um, started out with some cracks, and then um, just eventually tore the road apart in the coming weeks and months. It moved for the better part of two months um, and just completely destroyed the road at this location. Um, within that period of time, once we noticed it was moving, you know, we obviously uh, contacted utility companies out in the area. We got all the critical utilities moved out of the area so they could still service the residents in the area. Um, we closed the road for obvious safety uh, reasons. And we, we began studying the slide from a geotechnical standpoint to see what was going on and to see what types of repairs could be made, um, both like a permanent repair and then also, you know, what could be done potentially um, on the interim to uh, regain connectivity of Mount Charlie Road. Um, and we also immediately began working with representatives from FEMA, given that this uh, was a result of a federally declared disaster, um, torrential downpours during that period of time. Really, groundwater is what's driving this, this land movement. Um, and over the coming months after after the slide came to rest, uh, we began to work um, on solutions for what a temporary repair might look like too as well. And really our biggest problem was identifying funding um, to be able to implement a temporary repair. Um, we were able to add this project to the damage inventory list with FEMA, um, but we still don't have a guarantee for any type of permanent repair, which will likely be in the millions of dollars, the three plus million um, range. Um, and so uh, once we came up with a solution, what we thought we could do to temporarily bridge this gap, uh, we began working with the elected official in that area, the supervisor uh, McPherson in the fifth district, um, really to identify funding that had, uh, you know, been slated for other areas of, of the district for pavement uh, management. Um, but we feel like this is important enough to move forward to try to reconnect this community. Um, we, I will say that we do we do expect to get reimbursed by the federal government. It's still in the queue, obviously. We don't have an obligation, but we'll be working very hard to recover those funds. The other thing I'll mention, too, the concept of this temporary road, this is fill material that would have to be brought in for the permanent repair anyhow. So we're not, we're, we're not doing any type of redundant work here, and it's not going to be a waste of resources to go ahead and implement a temporary structure at this time. Um, okay, so with that, I have a presentation today, um, and the presentation today is going to cover, could you go to the next slide, please? Oh, awesome. Okay, uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about what the scope of the project is. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of slides that have um, some of the project plans that were developed by our engineers. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the field uh, regarding construction operations and a status update as to what's happening actually today. And then there's a few photos at the very end of the slide. This should go very quickly. Um, so again, you know, the goal of this, this emergency project is to reinstate um, safety access and address uh, the critical interruption and loss of essential public services. Um, in doing this, 
you know, the first thing we had to do to get out there is really clean up the site. There's a lot of debris out there, broken up asphalt. Um, and so all this is going to be the first order of business is to clear and grub the area and offhaul all that, um, all that debris and material. And then we'll start prepping the site, you know, for what we, this temporary roads um, fill is going to look like. Um, it's going to involve quite a bit of, of drainage. We really want this road. While we are building on an active slide, I will say this is why we're calling it temporary in nature. This is not the permanent fix. Permanent fix is going to involve retaining structures that are socketed into bedrock. So what we're really doing is we're bridging this gap um, uh, with a reinforced soil earthen fill. It's going to be 15 feet wide, so it's going to be a one-lane road. And, you know, we're very concerned for the durability of this road. We fully anticipate we're going to have to make it through a few winters, if not several, um, before we can gather the funding together necessary to implement the permanent repair. So we're putting in an extensive amount of drainage as well. Um, so the area can shed water during large storm events. Um, and so, you know, I would say just at this point, our two biggest concerns for this road are durability and safety. And really safety of the traveling public is paramount, right? And so this is going to be a 15-foot road that doesn't have guardrails on the side. Um, and we are still deciding exactly what the final surface is going to be, but it's going to have to be some type of a wearing surface. And whether that's oil and screenings or a thin overlay, we haven't made that decision yet. Um, but uh, we know it's going to get used by local traffic. Um, one of the things we're considering is is heavily limiting uh, loads, heavy loads, um, like garbage trucks, propane trucks, uh, you know, construction type of equipment, loaded concrete trucks and stuff like that. We we want folks to drive this over this very slowly, less than five miles an hour as such. We'll have stop signs at both ends of this of this new new structure. And um, and again, we'll we're considering load limits, maybe like you know, all the way down to five tons. Um, we just don't want anything heavy going over this site. And I will also say that uh, construction of this nature, we do expect it to move a little bit. It, you know, there will be some settlement with the earthen fill. And the fact that we're on a, an active landslide, we anticipate there'll be some movement and we'll be monitoring that as, as construction completes. Um, and so with that, we'll have all kinds of signage, all kinds of delineators, all kinds of stuff to keep people going really, really slow over this site. Um, Okay, and just addressing some of the costs of the project, we en we estimate it's going to be about a half a million dollars in construction. Um, we're in a design kind of build situation with a contractor out there, um, so it's a rough estimate. Um, but that, with all the soft costs that are associated with the work we do, including construction management and overhead and so forth, um, it'll probably be right at about the seven hundred thousand mark. And we think it's going to take about four to six weeks to build, and we're about two weeks into construction. Slide. Okay, so just a couple photos here of sort of what our engineers have cooked up. And you can see the gray areas is sort of what's left of Mountain Charlie Road. And then in the middle there is the, the fill, 15-foot um, wide fill at the top that we'll be doing to bridge the gap. Next slide, please. Um, and then just, again, some engineering details on what this soil-reinforced um, fill is going to look like. Um, so we actually bring in uh, soil, soil fabric. So this is reinforcing fabric, and we put it in in layers as we compact the fill, bringing it up. So in essence, we're bridging this gap with, with, a, with a very, very well-reinforced soil structure. Next slide. And this is probably less easy to read, um, but this is a little bit of the drainage details just to show that as we build this fill up, we'll be putting all kinds of drainage facilities in to um, not only uh, drain the surface water, storm waters that will be certainly coming this next winter and subsequent winters, but also to drain subsurface water as well. So we'll be putting in subsurface drains all collected in a manifold system, which, you know, will get down past this, this fill. All right, um, so just a little bit of the details of what's going on. Um, we got authority uh, to proceed with this on August 8th. Um, that Actually, that same evening, we held a public uh, meeting uh, with the Mount Charlie residents out there to let them know what was going on. This was the culmination of, I think, four other public meetings that we had been held with the community since the slide began. Um, and we let them know that construction was going to be starting soon on this temporary road, that we had identified some funding to do it. Uh, we had also identified a contractor who had the resources, the know-how, um, uh, and, and equipment and so forth to do it. Um, and we shared with them, you know, what our hours were going to be and how we were going to manage the site during construction. There's a lot of people traversing that site on a daily basis, uh, getting to and from work and taking their kids to and from school. So, you know, we worked it out with the community to try to, try to get all their um, crossing to the slide before 8 a.m. We opened it up at noon or for about 30 minutes to let folks through. But we really want to get let our 
contractor have that area in a safe manner so that um, he can get the, as much work done as possible in a day. Um, okay, yeah, and then so just what we've done to date, it's been a couple weeks of construction. Um, there were a couple other utilities I needed to be relocated out of there. We worked with the water company and I think frontier was the last company that had utilities there. We had to get that stuff out of the way. The contractor is able to mobilize in. Uh, we quickly began sampling the soil for off haul materials. Cause obviously we, we don't want to know what we're, what we're off hauling and what, where we're able to take it. And uh, then the contractor just went to town and began uh, clearing out the site and getting rid of, you know, rid of all the debris that existed there. Um, and set up some temporary staging area and put up all the signs. And all this happened like within the first couple of days of getting out there. Um, and then what's happening today is uh, we're we're in the middle of doing rough site grading. You can actually see the roads start to develop now. And I think towards the end of this week, we'll be hauling in the fill material and we'll be begin building that reinforced earth structure. So this is what uh, what it looked like um, just, just a couple months ago when it was completely destroyed. Um, it had dropped, you know, about 10 to 15 feet. Um, and obviously you couldn't pass it. Um, but it had come to a rest, um, and we'd collected all the geotechnical data we had to. And then this is the contractor beginning to mobilize and setting up all his equipment. And uh, now the contractor's out there. This is just, just uh, last week, early last week, is uh, getting all the debris and getting all that old ass cracked up asphalt um, and stuff out of the, out of the site. Um, same thing, gathering it, uh, dump trucks, and most of this stuff's being accessed from the north, by the way. Um, most of the, the, the haul trucks, debris trucks are going in and out in the north. And now that we're doing our say grading, and this is a sort of middle of last week. I was actually out there on Friday last week, and it was starting to look really good. This next slide, I think, is going to show, uh, yep, so you can start to see the roadbed developed. We're starting to bridge that gap there. Now, keep in mind, this is all native material here. It's not that great a soil, actually, when it comes to cohesion. So um, once we get everything rough graded out, obviously, that's when we bring in the good material that's going to be soil reinforced. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I guess we'll read the recommended actions. So we have this, didn't get in here, but you got it. So the recommended actions today are to find that the damage to Mount Charlie Road post mile 1.63 constitutes an emergency within the meaning of public contract code section 1102. Uh, secondly, pursuant to public contract code section 22050, find that the nature of the emergency at Mount Charlie uh, Post mile 1.63 does not allow for competitive bidding by four-fifths vote. Uh, thirdly, pursuant to public contract code section 22050, find that there is a need to continue emergency action by four-fifths vote. And lastly, direct the Department of Community Development Infrastructure to return on September 10th with a report on the progress of the ongoing emergency work and staff's available to answer any questions you may have. Great. All right. Thank you very much for that presentation and for the update on Mountain Charlie Road. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are really excited about uh, this moving forward. And so um, before we bring it to the board, I'd like to bring it to the members of the public to see if there's any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item. So you can approach the podium. You'll have two minutes. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I live in the rural areas too. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Seeing no other member of the public here present who'd like to speak to us on this item, I'll turn it to the clerk to see if there's any member of the public online who'd like to address us. I see no speakers online, Chair. Okay, with that, I'll bring it back to the board. Any final questions, comments, action? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you heard from me on, on this one. Uh, but let me begin by thanking the uh, Mountain Charlie Road uh, residents for their advocacy and patience uh, since uh, February. We know this has been a very difficult time for the residents. I'm also greatly appreciative of our Public Works Department and for their efforts to do whatever we could to ease the burden as quickly as possible with a continuous and sliding or unstable um uh, bedrock that or lack thereof that we had up there. So I can't say enough about what the team did to try to get to this as quickly as possible. Um, the project also represents an investment in our long-term fix. This is a temporary fix has been mentioned. Uh, we're hopeful that FEMA and Cal EOS uh, will eventually reimburse the county for this project and many, many more in our, our county. And I, I want to thank also Senators, uh, Senator Laird and Assemblymember Pellerin, Congressman Panetta, each of whom have visited that site, uh, for their efforts and to pursue further state and federal funding. Um, it can be underscored enough how much uh, 
Uh, this using Measure D funding dedicated to my district in fiscal year 24-5 uh, represented the best option for helping the community in the, as near a term as we could do. So I just want to say thank you for your patience uh, and thank you for getting on this. And please, uh, everyone up there who's, whether you're a resident or visiting somebody up there, take it slow and take it easy because uh, that's going to let this last for as long as possible. So thank you very much. Any other comments from board members? Okay. Seeing none, um, I just want to also express appreciation for the work of uh, county staff on this and for the patience of all the residents. Um, I think, you know, Supervisor McPherson summed it up very well. Um, and, you know, it's moving forward, and we have to continue to, to see how these types of events are going to be impacting our community and, and continue to do our best to maintain our roads. I guess the only um, additional direction maybe we could consider is just sending a letter updating Assemblymember Peller and Senator Laird and Congressman Panetta on uh, the progress that we're making on this and for the, to, and, and to ask that they, they continue to advocate for more funding for this project. We can do that. So. Great. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it back to Supervisor McPherson. I make we approve the recommended action. Sure. Okay. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Friend. I think that does contain the additional direction for the letters of updates to the... We've got that? Yes. Yep. All right. With that, I'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Aye. Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. With that, let's continue moving on. The next item on our agenda is um, actually um, before we move on to the next item, we're going to have items numbers, the presentation of items numbers 11, 12, and 13. We'll have all those presentations at once. And um, and then we'll have uh, one round of oral communications during that time. Um, I'll provide two and a half minutes since we're combining oral communications on three items and then we'll bring it back to the board for action and we'll take independent actions on each of the items and so with that i will turn it over to uh, nicole coburn to kick us off on item numbers 11 which is consider status report on county commission representation and restructuring efforts as part of the santa cruz like me project approving contact ordinance repealing chapter 2.0 one two zero of the count santa cruz county code to sunset the fire department advisory commission approving concept ordinance amending sections 2.46.060 of the santa cruz county code regarding compensation for members of the civil service commission approving concept ordinance amending chapters 2.48 of the santa cruz county code related to the juvenile justice commission and the delinquency prevention commission proven concept ordinance amending chapters 2.38 of the santa cruz county code to update the commission policy ordinances for boards commissions committees department advisory groups of santa cruz county We'll also have a presentation on item number 12, which is consider approving in concept ordinance amending chapters 2.54 of the Santa Cruz County Code regarding the purpose of the commissions on the environment. Approve proposed revisions to the commission on the environment bylaws and take related actions. And then finally, item number 13, consider approving in concept ordinance amending chapters 2.96 of the Santa Cruz County Code regarding water advisory commission to be updated and consistent with recent revisions to chapters 2.3 of the Santa Cruz County Code. Approve proposed revisions to the water advisory commission bylaws and take related actions. And I will turn it over to Nicole to kick us off. Uh, thank you, Chair Cummings and members of the board. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Nicole Coburn. I'm assistant CAO or one of the assistant CAOs here in the county administrative office. Um, I supervise the clerk of the board's office and have been working on the Santa Cruz County Like Me project. With me for today's presentation are David Carlson. He's a resource planner with the Community Infrastructure and Development Department and Sierra Ryan, who's a water resources manager in the health services agency. We are here to give you an update on the Santa Cruz County Like Me project and as well as provide updates on various county code and bylaw changes related to county commissions. I'm going to start the presentation and then we'll hand it over to David Carlson, who will then hand it over to Sierra Ryan and we'll wrap up. 
So as you will recall, um, just as a reminder, the Santa Cruz County Like Me project acknowledges that people with different lived experiences can help inform and shape county policy and governance to ensure our county is a place where everyone can thrive and belong. Um, I'm going to start with the commission representation update and then we'll transition into commission restructuring. So we presented findings and recommendations to you almost a year ago on October 17th. These recommendations were unanimously approved by the Board of Supervisors and included establishing a youth advisory task force. The task force is going to be examining youth representation and engagement on county boards and commissions. It will be comprised of 15 teens and young adults ages 14 to 24 they are going to have an option to receive a $75 stipend per meeting like our boards and commissions or earn community service hours. Um, we are currently, um, we have the application open for youth to apply to the task force. And once we get through the application process, the task force is going to be meeting monthly with the facilitator in locations around Santa Cruz County. Um, we also intend to provide bus passes for transportation for those who might need them. We are targeting the first meeting this October, and then based on the work of the task force over the next year, the CAO is going to return to the board with findings and recommendations. This is um, our social media um, uh, image that we've been promoting online. Um, there is a QR code here for youth who may wish to apply to the task force. I believe we already have close to 20 applications. So we are have a lot of interest. The deadline to apply is Friday, September 20th. In addition to the task force, uh, the Clerk of the Board is continuing to work on a phased project to standardize commissioner onboarding and providing other support. As you can see here on this slide, we've been conducting a variety of different efforts. Um, we hold triannually training sessions and office hours with the staff liaisons to boards and commissions. We have a resources library on a team site for them. We've been developing standardized operating procedures. We are considering an onboarding day for new commissioners that would help um, facilitate this in terms of getting them aware of our procedures. And then we're developing handbooks, both for staff liaisons and commissioners, which we hope to launch very soon. Uh, a mentor buddy program has also been envisioned and we intend to pilot this with the task force. The stipend program launched on January 1st of 2024, and we've streamlined this process with DocuSign forms, which makes it much easier for commissioners and staff liaisons to get um, commissioners who wish the stipend into the program. Currently, about 42% of commissioners are receiving the stipend and 58% 50, of commissioners are not. And this excludes staff members who serve on commissioners. This just represents the community members. We are recommending extending the stipends to community members who serve on department advisory groups. We don't have any department advisory groups currently, but we are in the process of establishing two, which I'll mention in just a bit. In the budget for this year, we have a $100,000 in the CAO budget to support the stipend program for commissioners and department advisory group members. I'm now gonna to turn to um, our updates on commission restructuring. So we presented the initial recommendations on commission restructuring back in January. Then in February, the board adopted an ordinance repealing five commissions. They're shown here on this slide. These five commissions sunsetted on March 31st. March 31st, um, this allowed time to complete our existing work and provide for a transition from the commissions to other forms of work. Um, we have both um, maintained commission websites and records according to our county policy and procedures and records retention. In terms of department advisory groups, um, we do have two department advisory groups, as I mentioned, that are in the works as in the works of forming. Um, we previously sunsetted the Human Services Commission and staff worked with an ad hoc subcommittee of the commission to draft bylaws that uh, they wish to bring to the Board of Supervisors. 
Pursuant to those bylaws, current commissioners have the opportunity to remain members of the new advisory group. The bylaws um, also specify that advisory group members will be representative of county demographics. The Human Services Department intends to bring those bylaws to the board on September 10th for your consideration. In addition, on July 17th, the Dep Fire Department Advisory Commission voted to sunset and transition to an advisory group that would support both the CAO and General Services Department on considering county fire um, services and functions. If repealed by the board, the commission will be eliminated on the 31st day final, following final adoption on September 10th. The advisory group will both consult and advise GSD on all manners relating to county fire and the county's fire protection, rescue, and emergency medical services program. The group is envisioned to com be comprised of members of um, County Service Area 48 or representatives of County Service Area 48, County Service Area 4, different geographical areas of the county, local fire departments and fire districts, and emergency medical services. Um, to support representation on these two groups to align with commissions, we recommend expanding the stipend program to department advisory groups. In terms of promoting these boards and commissions and groups, um, we have been doing that as well on social media, on our county website, and through other partners and other avenues. This is one of our flyers shown here. Uh, for commission updates, um, we're going to get into two commissions specifically that are being bringing to you um, county code changes and bylaw updates. But just briefly, I wanted to mention a few others um, that or have had changes in the works. The Civil Service Commission, which is a part of this item, is updating county code to implement stipends. The Emergency Medical Care Commission has been working on revising their bylaws to align with all of these changes we're making to county code, specifically in Chapter 2.38, and those will be brought to you at a future meeting. The Environmental Health Appeals Commission, um, county staff, county council and staff have been working on updating county code to handle appeals through the administrative hearing process, which we previously mentioned we were going to be doing. There are reference to this in county code that we need to update. The Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission is, has revised its bylaws and you approved that at our last meeting or your last meeting. The Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission also has references in county code that need to be updated and county council and staff are working on removing those references. The Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission has been meeting with a CAO, county council and the probation department on updating the county code related to its commission. There was very little information in there and so we have now have a, an ordinance attached to this item that specifies its authority, purpose, membership, powers, and duties. Mental Health Advisory Board has been working on revising county code and its bylaws to expand its membership. As you may recall, we sunsetted the Substance Use Disorder Commission. The Mental Health Advisory Board will now be taking on some of those responsibilities and expanding its membership. Parks and Recreation Commission has also developed a work plan to focus, improve its focus and engagement um, in various efforts around the county. In addition to all those commissions and the activities that have been going on to update them, <laughs> um, we have some additional cleanup items related to Chapter 2.38, which is the governing policy for all commissions. We realized that we needed to clean up the language related to quorum and requiring that commission or committee members have a valid oath of office on file with the clerk of the board. We are also extending the stipend program, as I mentioned, to members of department advisory groups. We needed to clarify when final appointment to fill an at-large vacancy is on the consent or regular agenda, so the cleanup um, clarifies that. And uh, we've um, improved the references to records and um, moved uh, records maintenance and public noticing um, to staff liaisons, which they're already currently doing, but it just cleans up that language. Um, and then staff liaisons um, are maintaining those and keeping them pursuant to state law and county policy. 
Lastly, uh, in the section on ethics, uh, we updated the list of commissions with decision-making authority to remove the ones that were sunsetted and then add the Historical Resources Commission, which we still have. So with that, I'm not going to read all the recommendations here, but we're asking, we have four ordinances attached to the Santa Cruz County Like Me item, which would sunset the Fire Department Advisory Commission, compensate members of the Civil Service Commission, outline the Juvenile Justice Commission and Delinquency Prevention Commissions, um, do these and whatnot, like I mentioned, and then update the Commission's policy ordinance. So I am going to now turn it over to David Carlson to speak to the Commission on the Environment. Um, okay, thank you. Um, the proposed updates to uh, Chapter 2.54 of the County Code establishing the Commission on the Environment would focus the purpose of the Commission's work on uh, the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. Mm -hmm. um, this is consistent with a, a long-standing work plan that the Commission has previously established for itself and with the measurement and accountability um, system developed for the CAP uh, presented to the Board in May of this year. Uh, with the updates would also clarify the role of the Commission on the Environment relative to the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission and the Water Advisory Commission, uh, where previously there had been some overlap and confusion between the Commission on the Environment and these other commissions. Um, while this change acknowledges the importance of climate action as a priority for the county, the Commission's purpose statement uh, retains its advisory role on other environmental issues or initiatives that the Board may direct the Commission to consider. Um, and it doesn't propose a change in the name of the Commission on the Environment. Um, along with the ordinance update, um, updates to the Commission bylaws are proposed to align the updates uh, to Chapter 2.38, the Commission's policy ordinance, which were approved by the Board in October of 2023. Um, next slide, please. So the staff is recommending the Board approve in concept to the updates to County Code Chapter 2.54, schedule the ordinance for second reading on September 10th, direct the Clerk of the Board to publish the Notice of Proposed Ordinance Summary, and approve the updates to the bylaws for the Commission on the Environment. And that concludes my section of the presentation. I'll turn it over to Sierra Ryan now. All right, thank you, David. I'll be speaking to item 13, which is um, proposed changes to chapter 2.96 of the Santa Cruz County Code regarding the Water Advisory Commission, or WEC. I'm Sierra Ryan, I'm the Water Resources Program Manager, and I'm also the Administrative Secretary to the WEC. Um, in creating these updates, the primary goal was to simplify the code to eliminate areas of inconsistency. Uh, the updated chapter reduces overlap, as David alluded to, with the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission to limit confusion over which body has oversight over specific issues and matters. Um, it also eliminates sections that are already included in Chapter 2.38, again, to eliminate any inconsistencies. In 2021, the WAC took on the responsibility for implementation of California Senate Bill 552, which focuses on drought response planning for domestic wells and state small water systems. And this new responsibility has been included in the updated powers and authorities. Um, next slide. Uh, so the staff recommendation is to approve in concept the ordinance amending chapter 2.96 to the Santa Cruz County Code regarding the WAC, um, schedule the second reading on September 10th, um, direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of proposed ordinance summary, and again, um, approve the proposed bylaws to the Water Advisory Commission. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. So I'll just wrap up by giving you an indication of what's coming at the next um, subsequent meetings. So on September 10th, um, the board would hear final uh, the second reading and final adoption of all the ordinances on these three items. Um, we will also be bringing forward to the board an item related to forming a subcommittee of the board to establish board procedures. Um, this is, we found that several jurisdictions have found it helpful to have a resource in place to govern topics like the authority and duty of the board chairperson, how agendas are created, and how much time staff 
is permitted to work on items without board direction. We see this as a natural outgrowth of everything we're doing to update procedures for county boards and commissions. And so we will bring bringing that item forward for discussion on the 10th. In addition, on September 24th, um, we will bring forward a resolution amending the original resolution establishing the stipend program so that we may extend it to department advisory groups once the ordinance is effective. And then we will be bringing forward also a, an item related to establishing a unified conflict of interest code for the entire county. Currently, departments have individual codes, which makes it very cumbersome to figure out which ones are up to date or not and for the public to see um, which positions have to file form 700. So we feel this is, this will increase transparency and accountability and efficiency for both staff and the public. And then finally, um, in the Santa Cruz County Like Me item, we are recommending that you direct staff to come back in March. Um, of that should say 2025, not 2026, sorry, with a status report on the Santa Cruz County Like Me project, which will be about six months into the task forces meeting, so we can give you an update on their progress. And with that, we're happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you all for those presentations. I'm going to open up to the public uh, to see if we can have members of the public comment on this item. And um, I'm actually going to give three minutes because since it's three items, it's about a minute per item. So if any member of the public would like to speak to us on this item, um, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you for granting the extra minute. <laughs> Becky Steinbrunner, I attend, um, have attended the Fire Department Advisory Commission meetings, as well as the Water Advisory Commission meetings for, for a long time. Um, my question is, how is this going, especially with regard to the, to the FDAC, how is this going to make it better for the people who live in CSA 48 and CSA 4 and the volunteers? I, I had a, a good conversation this morning with a, a member of the FDAC whom I respect so much. And he said, it has been a waste of time the way it has been because how fire simply and, and really general services department just brings to us what's already been done. We have had no opportunities really to make recommendations to review the material before it goes and happens. We're just passive audience. <laughs> so he's hopeful that making, um, absolving the, uh, dissolving the commission and changing to a new advisory group could be an improvement directly working with general services department and the CAO's office. And how is it going to change? How will it change? Will it simply be another check off the box that they've been consulted when it's already been done? And I also have to question if this is a good timing because your board hasn't heard it formally yet, but Santa Cruz County LAFCO is preparing to bring to you, maybe at the next meeting, huge plans for reorganization of Santa Cruz County Fire Department to be an independent fire district. So do you want the advice of your commissioners to help you understand through this or they're gonna be dissolved in 31 days after this? When would the advisory group be formed such that they could be the liaison with you and the members of the public in this massive restructuring plan? that is set to go pretty quickly. Mr. Serrano said maybe 18 months. That's pretty fast. Um, so I, I'd like some discussion about that. And regarding the Water Commission, it's an excellent group, very well managed, very well run by Ms. Ryan. The question I have, and, and Ms. Coburn, you did send me an email, but I didn't understand it. It looks to me that under the changes, the uh, commission could not form subcommittees. 
And I have an issue with that because they have small groups that do form to study certain things like PFOS and things like that and bring recommendations back to the commission as a whole. And I would like to see that continue. Thank you, Ms. Thank Ms. you for your consideration. Thank you. But any other members of the public here present who would like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, I'd like to see if there's any member of the public online who'd like to speak to us on this item. Yes, sure. We do have speakers online. Jean Brocklebank, your microphone's now available. Uh, there will be two of us speaking from this screen. <laughs> the, the commission, um, although we have no particular opposition to amending the purpose of the Commission on the Environment, because it's always focused on climate change to the detriment of consideration of environmental destruction and or mismanagement. But we do have a suggestion to rename this commission. The Commission on the Environment should be rena renamed the Commission on Climate Action and Adaptation Planning and Implementation. Shorter name would be the Commission on the CAAP. This is why. The proposed, the notice of uh, public summary said that the goal is to change the purpose of the commission to focus on implementation of the county's climate action and adaptation plan and advise the board of supervisors um, in terms of the CAAP. The staff memo says that they, the goal of the amendment is to establish a stronger connection between this commission on the environment and the climate climate adaptation plan. All the amendments to the bylaws, duties and responsibilities are strictly focused on CAAP and environment is mentioned only as it relates to equity and justice, not to conserving local natural resources. Um, all of the amendments to chapter 2.54050 likewise uh, eliminate the mechanical and chemical poisoning, destruction of the environment. So this is a commission, not a commission on the environment. It's a commission on climate action and adaptation planning and implementation. The apparently the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission and the Water Advisory Commission have been handed the other environmental, real environmental destruction, mechanical, chemical poisoning goals. So let's rename this properly. Uh, instead of calling it the Commission on the Environment, call it the Commission on Climate Action and Adaptation Planning and Implementation. Um, and then uh, that's what I wanted to say. And then Michael Lewis is here also on this screen if he can speak after me. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. We've always been concerned about the lack of consideration for the broader environmental problems caused by um, growth and expansion into natural habitat areas. The Commission on the Environment has never really addressed that, uh, and it's always been frustrating because it seems like that should be the, the commission that handles this. The Fish and Wildlife Commission handles specifically fish and wildlife, but there is much of the natural world that doesn't involve fish and wildlife. It involves forests and grasslands and critical habitats that are necessary for those fish and wildlife and other living things that, that live in the natural areas that we share with lots of other animals and plants. So um, it's disappointing to see this a, a change, especially the fact that it is characterized as not uh, eliminating environmental consideration when in fact it does completely eliminate that from the purposes and the uh, duties of this commission. So, rename it. So renaming this commission is probably the best way to go but also we need to give thought to what then happens to the other environmental problems that are caused by the uh, human growth and development in our natural areas. Um, call it what it this is. needs to be, this is, we have to call the environment what it is and environmental considerations what they are in order to have a mechanism in county government to handle environmental problems that exist today. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. 
All right, so maybe we can start if there's um, questions that came up by members of the public that um, staff might want to speak to. Maybe we can start there and then I'll open it up for questions from board members. Yeah, I can. Um, I'll start with the comment or question about uh, the subcommittees related to the Water Advisory Commission. Um, I did email Ms. Steinbrenner to clarify that we removed them from the county code and bylaws because Chapter 2.38 governs the commissions and it speaks to the fact that commissions may create com commission or subcommittees or um, whatnot and um, they can do that freely once they do that they just need to report that to the board of supervisors so i believe the existing language is that or the old language was that the commission had to get board a board resolution to create them so that's no longer the case according to county code yep. any other questions i know that there's some concerns raised by Ms. Brocklebank and Mr. Lewis regarding the Commission on the Environment, so maybe someone could speak to those. David could speak to that. Sure. It, um, I, I understand the concerns uh, regarding the language, but it certainly was not the intent of the Commission on the Environment in approving these um, changes to their purpose to eliminate their um, addressing any other environmental issues that the board may direct them to consider. <laughs> All right, um, I'll open up to board members to see if there's any questions or comments from board members. We'll start to my right with Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. First, just want to thank staff for uh, all the work to update and modernize our commissions. Um, you know, as was noted earlier, um, with the Mental Health Advisory Board bringing our attention to uh, some federal regulations, our commissions are incredibly important for providing more eyes and ears and uh, good minds to solve the many problems that uh, we confront as a board and as a county. Um, so again, thanks for this important work. Um, the question came up about the, the Fire Department Advisory Committee. Um, I do think that, you know, first of all, the uh, the or sorry, commission commission did uh, of course vote themselves to become an advisory committee with my own uh, correspondence with my first district commissioner. Um, my understanding is that will just give them more flexibility, particularly to consider uh, issues related to the Cal Fire contract. Um, which, of course, is a lot of um, very fundamental to county fires work. Um, and so I think that having that additional flexibility, and of course, that's why we are extending the stipends to um, advisory committee members as well, uh, will, will ultimately be uh, in everyone's best interest. Um, and I, I know that um, that's why the commissioners themselves supported this action. Um, also, if related to the Commission on the Environment, I think uh, Mr. Carlson summed it up well that um, I don't think we want to preclude or eliminate our ability to uh, have the Commission on the Environment ultimately address other environmental issues that are important to the board. Um, and so while this um, is certainly focusing their work a little bit more on climate action and adaptation, um, we still need some group that's capable of taking on those issues in the future. And so um, I think that maintaining it as the Commission on the Environment is the right move. So, yeah, support of the actions today. Supervisor Brown. Yeah, the, uh, let me just say that we haven't taken a structured look at this in decades. And over time, as you can imagine, um, it creates redundancies. It creates inconsistencies. Um, our, our office has been functionally initiated this process through a lot of discussions about um, our appointees feeling that they didn't have adequate training coming in. They weren't fam familiar with what they had to do with some, uh, Form 700. Our commission on the environment saying we're functionally doing the same thing with the water department. I mean, so commission's doing so at the end of the day, this needed, we needed to take a macro look. Um, the only advice I, I suppose I can give moving forward on this, I'm obviously supportive of the actions today is that we shouldn't wait 30 years to do this the next time. So I think that there needs to be an ongoing review process. So it doesn't seem so significant or drastic. This is the same thing when we do fee schedules, et cetera, where things aren't really updated and then there's this large, hike. Um, so I just think that the CEO's office should build in a, a process review moving forward, whether that's annual or, or every two years or every even five years, just something that, that that ensures because there is always a scope creep. There's always a desire to respond to community desires for new commissions or new advisory groups or new issues. And, and uh, that's what got us here today. And so I just want to put a future board in the same situation. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. 
Yeah, I, um, thank you. I think this is a long time in coming, and it's about time. And I want to thank uh, Assistant uh, CEO uh, Nicole Coburn, as well as uh, David Carlson and Sarah Ryan for the work on the environmental issues and the water. Um, I, I think I really appreciate the effort to diversify our commissions and to establish the stipends. I think it's going to be a drawing card, of course. Uh, I think this is going to be a, a result in a more efficient and representative uh um, commission structure that we have. And uh, it's a lot of work and it's about time. Uh, as it was said by Supervisor Friend, um, it's been a long time in coming. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a good thing for representative government in Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. No, I, I think um, Supervisor McPherson said a lot of the things that I would like to say. Uh, to diversify our our um, boards that we have, and to you know really um, give folks the opportunity to serve on boards that normally wouldn't even apply uh, for different factors, work, um, time off from work, uh, the distance to travel to Santa Cruz. Uh, transportation issues, different things like that. And so, you know, I, I, I like a supervisor Zach friend, I hope it's like a, a work in, in progress, right? That we continue updating this um, Santa Cruz like me project as well. Um, but I'm supportive and um, like to see it evolve as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I want to just appreciate the amount of work that's gone into this effort to try to streamline um, our commissions and committees. Um, I do have a few questions, and then I have some concerns and maybe some um, recommendations. Um, the first question I had, I just as we were going through this, um, and I know that we're shifting from having um, you know board appointed members to advisory members. Some of those who have been appointed by the board will be um, moving forward in that same capacity as an advisory board member, but it's not clear who will be appointing future advisory board members, if that's going to be the board members or if that's going to be staff. And so that's just a question I had for staff because right now they kind of, it's, it's not clear whether the board will have any role in that. And I think that, you know, as electeds, um, there's folks who we, have within our communities who are interested in participating in, on these boards and so just wanted to get some sense of how that selection process will be moving forward so um i know this came up previously in some of our conversations the department advisory groups are appointed by the department heads so the board of supervisors does not have the authority to appoint to those groups um, your authority rests with the county's boards and commissions and committees. Um, there are, as I mentioned, the HSD department advisory group that's forming has bylaws, which you'll see at the next meeting, and they have language allowing their current commissioners to transition onto that group. And then there's language about representation to ensure diversity of the members on that group, but it will be Director Morris who appoints to that group. Is that going to be the same for all? It will be for all department advisory groups. It's not advising the board of supervisors. It's advising the department. Okay. Um, the next question I have that's related to that um, are the Form 700 requirements. So I believe that reading through that the people, even those who will be department advisory um, members will have to take an oath of office, if I read that correctly. But I'm also wondering, are they going to have to fill out a Form 700? Because there are, I guess, one of the concerns that maybe members of the public might have is, do people have some kind of financial conflict of interest? And is that going to be transparent? And so I'd like to know whether, because it seems like that might be an additional requirement that we all have and other appointed commissioners have. And yeah, you are correct. So we have discovered through all of this that we have our decision-making bodies which are all required to fill out a Form 700. But now that we have the stipend program, receiving public funds, if you're receiving the stipend, you have to fill out a Form 700, is my understanding. 
So anyone you would appoint who is a community member who opts into the stipend program would be filling out the Form 700. And that would be the same for the Department Advisory members as well? That for the Department Advisory groups, I think that will, but I'd probably have to defer to County Council. We can look more into that. Okay. I think it'd be important to have that information when we bring this back for second readings because you know, as we're making this transition, I think it's just also important that we're trying to maintain um, transparency and so that members of the public understand, you know, what financial situations are for folks um, who are serving in those roles. Um, as it relates to the, the, the FDAC, the Fire Advisory um, Commission, uh, I've spoke with my member who's on there and they you know, also agreed that it seems like it'd be a good transition and that it could be something that's very positive. And so just want to make sure folks um, understand that there there was support for this from the Fire Advisory Commission. I would say that um, the one thing that was heavily emphasized by um, my appointee was the need to have representatives from all the independent fire districts on that um, advisory board. And so I don't know if that needs to be formally posed in any motion that's made, but um, you know, county fire impacts all of the small fire districts, and it's really critical that as these changes are being made, that they're also at the table. And so um, that's one of the things that I hope that we can ensure this. And I know it's mentioned that local fire agencies, but I think, you know, to the extent that all the fire departments, all the independent districts are invited to the table um, is something that I think will be important in this regard. Um, and then finally, um, I guess my I, I share some strong concerns that were raised regarding the Commission on the Environment, and and I'm, I'm sure it wasn't the intent uh, to kind of remove the language around environment, but reading through kind of the red line version of the ordin of the update, um, it really does strictly focus and limit the purpose of the group to the climate action plan, climate action adaptation plan, and so um, I'm just wondering. Maybe this is a question for county council. You know, with this, if we wanted to have that, um, the recommendations and the purpose still include environment, would that need to come back as a first reading, or could we? Could there be language that's proposed today that could continue to have its scope and purpose be around environment and not strictly on the climate action adaptation planning? We can propose language today. It's a very small change that would be made to two point five four point oh five oh f and. We have some language that the board could consider if it was interested in doing that. <laughs> so I'd like to see if maybe we could see what that language is and have that so, be considered by the board. So that language would be to modify um, subsection F to state, quote, exercise any other responsibilities concerning environmental issues or initiatives that may be set forth in the commission's bylaws or that may be directed by the board, period. Okay, so we can have that language included. I think it would really help so that this um, commission can continue to explore other topics outside of the climate action plan. And, and I just say that because um, Supervisor Koenig and I serve on the Tobacco Waste Subcommittee. And, you know, one of the things is as we bring that item forward, you know, we thought it might be good to have that go to a commission. If the commission's purpose is strictly focused on climate action, it's really hard to make the tie between plastic waste on beaches, which is a very concern of, I think, many of ours and how it impacts the environment. Um, and in the absence of being able to send that to the Commission on the Environment, it's kind of, well, how like, how do we, when there's broader issues around environmental impacts and, and uh, concerns around um, our environment, you know, how do we bring those things forward? And so this was just an example of how the change in that language impacted our ability to get a commission to weigh in on something that's not related to climate action, but is related to uh, environmental pollution. And so this change, I think, will help us be able to continue to get input from these kinds of commissions. So, so that was a lot, but I guess with that, um, entertain a motion with the additional recommendations. I'll move the recommended actions with the modification to the Commission on the Environment language. Second. So a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Hernandez. Um, it's all three items too, right? 
Actually, I think we're going to need to go through. Actually, I'll, I'll defer to. You don't need to go through all three uh, items separately unless you want to. If you want to take staff direction on all three items at the same time, with the additional direction, you're able to do that. I'll move the recommended actions for all three items with the additional direction on the Commission of the Environment language. Second. It's been motion by Supervisor Friends, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez. And then as it relates to the um, some of the comments that were made on the fire advisory committee, I'm wondering maybe if. Can I add sure. to that? So the bylaws for that commission or that advisory group are going to be coming to the board as well. So I believe Director Beaton's in the audience. So I'm sure he can work with the group that's working on the bylaws to take that under consideration. Eventually, the board will have to approve those bylaws. Sounds good. All right. With that, I'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote on the item. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Fernandez. Aye. McPherson. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay. So with that, um, I believe we have one more item on our regular agenda before we move into closed sessions. Supervisor Friend. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Item 14, unfortunately, has um, a consideration of one of the recommended actions regarding the rail trail. So I need to recuse myself because I have a personal financial, potential personal financial interest in the fact that I live within 500 feet of the rail line. So even though this item is much broader than that, because that's one of the recommended actions, I unfortunately need to recuse since it's on the regular agenda, I actually need to leave the room. So it's, been good, it's been good hanging out with you. All right. Okay. With that, um, we'll move on to our last regular session item. Consider an update on county strategic initiatives, including a biannual progress report on the county operational plan, development of a countywide equity framework, and 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 focus performance improvements and take related actions. And I'll turn this over to Nicole Coburn um, to kick us off this presentation. Thank you again. Um, Nicole Coburn, Assistant CAO. Um, I'm here to just kick off this presentation, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sven Stafford in our office. He's a principal administrative analyst who has um, been spear spearheading our strategic management model. We also have here today Irma Marquez from the Human Services Department, Carolyn Burke from the Community Development and Infrastructure Department, Sierra Ryan from the Health Services Agency, and Sam Laforte from the County Administrative Office, who are going to speak to different elements in today's item. Um, so just briefly to cover our agenda, um, I'm going to talk about the strategic plan refresh that we'll be going into in the coming year or so. Um, we'll also touch on our equity framework that will provide an update on our operational plan and department objectives, and then we'll conclude with an update on performance management. <laughs> So just to remind you, I think you've seen this graphic before, but this is our strategic um, management model. We have equity at the center surrounded by our strategic plan and equity statement, our operational plan and budget, and then performance management. This follows a plan, do, study, adjust um, framework, which you might be familiar with. Um, our current strategic plan encompassed six years from 2018 when the board approved it through 2024. This plan is coming to its end this year. We have in mind a plan to refresh, refresh the county strategic plan and a timeline is shown here. We would move into an after action review in this fiscal year, which would take place um, in the winter, starting with an internal after action with county staff, we also imagine doing community listening sessions or other engagement with it in the community to figure out what our achievements, our challenges, and lessons learned were from the original strategic plan. We would then synthesize this information and um, summarize our major findings and recommendations which we would bring to the board um, during the summer of 2025, um, a framework to engage both with county staff and the public to um, develop our new strategic plan. We uh, would like to start the public engagement process for the strategic plan refresh in fall of 2025. 
we would then bring back a draft plan in the winter, get the board's feedback and make any adjustments that are necessary for the board to approve it in spring of 2026. Um, and we'll, we'll be um, entertaining your questions and input a little bit later. But with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Sven, who's going to talk about our community indicators. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, good morning, board. Um, I think the thing that we want to highlight throughout the rest of the presentation is really our focus on collaboration, uh, not only internally in the county across departments, but also with our community partners. Um, when we brought the equity statement to the board back in October of 2023, we made a commitment to come back with uh, community indicators uh, that also aligned with eight conditions of well-being that you see across the top of the slide here. Uh, we had originally proposed a set of about 25 community indicators in 2019. And when we went back and looked at where we had really made progress, one thing that stood out was um, really in terms of our uh, reduction in, uh, in homelessness. And part of, uh, part of the reason for that, I think, is the alignment around the Housing for Health Partnership how board and elected officials have come together, uh, how that's really aligned the work of staff and community partners, and how we've used uh, data and uh, and different narratives about folks that are unhoused in our community to really build momentum and see those numbers reduce. And even when we get you know sidetracked, we still have a north star that's provided by um, by this alignment. Uh, next slide, Nicole. And so the the question is can we really take advantage of that power of aligned contributions um, and using board priorities and community initiatives uh, to look at indicators and align with partners to get better results. And so you can see on the slide, you know, we've we've talked today about the climate adap climate action and adaptation plan. Uh, we've reached out to the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. Um, with Workforce Santa Cruz County Thrive by Five uh, to really look at how we can align county reports and initiatives uh, to these to these eight conditions of well-being. Uh, we weren't quite able to get the the indicators ready for uh, ready for live you know for, for showtime today, uh, but it's something that we intend to to continue to work on and bring back at a minimum before our next update in January. Uh, next slide, Nicole. For our work putting uh, equity into action, um, we have a couple of things that we want to highlight for the board. Uh, through our KC leadership program this year, we've had over 100 staff uh, participate in um, in some form of uh, in some form of that framework and practice. Uh, that's really helping us keep. Uh, keep equity at the center. It's bringing in experts from uh, across the country and allowing our staff to collaborate uh, across uh, across sectors and also get experience um, participating in nationwide groups. Uh, the picture on the left was taken down at uh, Seacliff State Beach back in June, uh, where we had a gathering of uh, over 50 of us who are engaged in this community of practice, both county and community staff. Uh, some examples of work that's, that have come out of that, um, that cohort include uh, work on digital equity and working across departments to make sure folks are able to enroll in discounted uh, internet services, uh, working with uh, newly appointed Sheriff Chris Clark on the construction of the DNA lab, uh, to really get at uh, sexual violence and and speeding processing times for for DNA evidence, and working with the housing authority of Santa Cruz County on making sure not only that we have housing vouchers available, but that they can actually also be used uh, by by folks trying to trying to rent in our communities. Uh, on the right, you see a picture of. Uh, some videos that we've been able to put together with help of a grant from the Casey Foundation to help us embed our work. Um, these are stories that show uh, show the community what it means to really focus on inclusivity and belonging, and hopefully to uh, support our staff, show them doing good work, and to show them how you know these contributions that they make to change can be done with. Um, with what we already have and that they can make a real impact. 
And so I'm wondering if uh, Juliet can play one of those videos for us. the Aquatics Program Specialist for Santa Cruz County Parks. I want Simpkins Family Swim Center to be a resource for every member of the community. I believe in the transformative power of water and making it accessible, including for those who benefit from a low stimulus environment. Low stimulus hours are specifically designated times where our staff create a more welcoming and calming environment and atmosphere. Catering to individuals who might have sensory sensitivities or just benefit from a quieter environment. People that typically benefit from this would be families that want to come and practice some skills away from outside designated swim lessons. And I have also noticed that caregivers will come with adults who typically need more assistance in the water. And I have also noticed that people use the water walkers and the water wheelchairs more during this time as it's a more comfortable environment for them to use those tools. Thanks, Julia. So we were able to we were able to produce five of those, and those are all up on YouTube. Um, we'll be sharing those over social media. And level four coach, we are exploring today ways in which freestyle was presented. Excellent. We haven't moved on to freestyle yet. <laughs> um, uh, so the, the one the one opportunity that we do have upcoming that's also funded through this grant is uh, something that we're calling an equity expo. That's going to be an opportunity in uh, in November for staff and community partners again to come together and try to create more collaborations and build trust. Um, that specific project is going to be about visualizing that collaboration and alignment that we have through art. Um, and we'll be reaching out to board offices in the in the next month with more information on that and how they might be able to participate. Uh, next slide, Nicole. For the current operational plan, um, we have completed about 32% of our objectives, 61% uh, of the objectives that were scheduled to be completed in June of this year were completed, and then uh, a number of others are amended uh, and in progress. And uh, in order to give some more context to, to those, um, we're inviting some staff to present on work that they've they've been pursuing through the through the operational plan today. And so I'd like to turn it over to Irma Marquez from the Human Services Department. Good afternoon, members of the board, um, Supervisor Cummings, Mr. Palacios. My name is Irma Marquez, and I'm in the Employment and Benefit Services Division Director. And today I want to talk to you about Medi-Cal um, re-enrollments. Maybe switch. And so um, Medi-Cal re-enrollments after COVID waivers specifically. Next slide, please. So Medi-Cal is the public health insurance program for low-income individuals and families. And the operational objective or the goal for my division was to ensure re-enrollment of 90% of eligible beneficiaries by June of 2024. The, in our county, um, countywide, there is roughly 96,000, a little bit over 96,000 individuals that are enrolled in Medi-Cal benefits. That's 36% of county residents enrolled. Of those 36% re, um, county residents, 81% of those reside in South County and are of Hispanic or Latino descent. And a significant portion of this community speaks languages other than English. Many are monolingual Spanish speakers, and there is a growing indigenous community that speaks the Mixteco dialect. These language barriers are pose substantial challenges in accessing essential services, such as healthcare benefits. In uh, March of 2020, public um, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and there was a public health emergency declared. During that period, there were flexibilities that would, were put in place to ensure that families did not lose their health care coverage. 
some of those flexibilities included not having to process an annual Medi-Cal renewal to reestablish eligibility. That was three years of waivers in where families did not have to come to the county to seek re-enrollment. Re Cases were automatically renewed and no, in, no benefits were interrupted. During the, three, during the three years of those waivers, families did not have to communicate with us, which meant that we would lose, we could potentially lose contact with them. Families moved. Once the resumption of Medi-Cal renewals started, which was in June of 2023, we could run the risk of losing families through no communication or by no communication. So in March of 2023, the Department of Healthcare Services launched a pretty aggressive outreach campaign to ensure that community members were informed or beneficiaries of Medi-Cal were informed about the resumption of Medi-Cal renewals to ensure that those Medi-Cal packets were returned and renewals began to, to happen beginning June of 2023. To ensure that we actually locally, we had our own community um, outreach campaign, which um, involved our partnership with community partners. And to ensure equity and accessibility, we partnered with CAB Thriving Immigrants Initiative for education, outreach, and application assistance. CAB is a trusted partner and helped bridge the language barriers. During the unwinding period, which was June of 2023 through uh, May of 2024, our department also went through some challenges that included the transition of into a new case management system known as CalSAWS. The implementation of CalSAWS happened on July 3rd, 2023, just one month into the resumption of Medi-Cal renewals. That, along with being short-staffed, really presented its challenges as the influx of those renewals started to, to come in. However, we never lost sight of our of our goal and continue to um, be diligent in processing those Medi-Cal renewals to ensure that all of those that continue to be eligible continue to receive their benefits. I'm happy to report that we've met our goal. In total individuals enrolled in fiscal year 2024 was 96,711, meeting our goal by 92% of retention. One other fact that I'd like to share with you is that throughout the unwinding period, the local percentage rate of renewals was consistent with that of the state at 81%. And this could be attributed to their aggressive outreach campaign as well as our efforts locally. Thank you. I will turn it over to Carolyn Burke and Sierra Ryan. Hi, thank you, Irma. <laughs> I'm Sierra Ryan. I'm the Water Resources uh, Manager for Environmental Health, and I'm here with Carolyn Burke from CDI uh, to tell you about a joint effort that we've been working on through the operational plan. Um, our two departments had the shared goal to develop mapping um, a mapping tool to evaluate high-level groundwater recharge opportunities in the county. The hope was through this effort, we would be able to identify sites for projects that could be used for both stormwater attenuation and groundwater replenishment. Uh, next slide. All right, so to develop this mapping tool, we incorporated as much information as possible. Uh, we used recharge suitability layers that were developed by UCSE that look at both surface and subsurface geologic conditions for and rank suitability. Public works crews identified areas that frequently experience inundation during um, inundation challenges during heavy rain flows. Um, and this information was then tied to individual parcels and then ranked. We prioritized publicly owned land and considered disadvantaged community status and parcel size. The public works GIS staff made the dashboard particularly easy to use. Um, but despite the great collaboration in developing the tool, no recharge locations appropriate for a county project development were identified. However, we do think that the tool still has great value, um, and I'll pass it along to Carolyn to describe that further. Good afternoon. Uh, the groundwater recharge, oh, we can go on to the next slide. Thanks. The groundwater recharge parcel identification and mapping tool has yielded data that can be leveraged by county staff and multiple departments, as well as partner agencies in several ways going forward. Understanding which parcels have the soil and hydrologic characteristics to support groundwater recharge can provide CDI planning and public works staff with important information to guide development and policy decisions. 
During, during early consultation, plans, planners can give feedback to applicants on how to configure their project to protect and enhance groundwater recharge areas. Highlighting parcels that have high infiltration and maybe conduits for potential pollutants to enter the groundwater, as well as those that are candidates for groundwater recharge projects, can also guide the direction of future codes and policies to support and maintain the health of our groundwater basins. Next slide, please. In addition to planning and policy efforts, environmental health will use the recharge tool as they are performing investigations for water quality or runoff complaints to assess the potential risk to groundwater resources. Our partner groundwater sustainability agencies can also use the tool to identify parcels for projects which could include active or passive recharge. We have begun discussions with CDI planning to introduce the tool and plan upcoming trainings for staff. We have no doubt as more people use this tool, we'll come up with even more ways to utilize this information to the benefit of our groundwater. Back to you, Sven. All right. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Sierra. Um, you know, we thought it was important again to highlight the collaborative aspects of those. And then even when we're not meeting the exact letter of the objective that we're still learning as staff. Um, for mid-cycle additions, we have four, uh, four proposed objectives to add to in health services, which really revolve around uh, staff and community engagement uh, that are being sort of reformed now that the health services agency has brought on an, a health service, a health equity officer. And so this reflects um, her, uh, her in influence and vision for that work. And then two objectives regarding the next uh, pieces of work related to the rail trail for both segments eight and nine and 10 and 11. Uh, and so those are um, included in the packet for the board's consideration. And I'll pass it back to, I'll pass it over to Sam LaForty to talk about process improvement work. Good afternoon, board. Sam LaForty with the County Administrative Office. Uh, we currently have several process improvement projects underway impacting the Auditor Tax Controller, Clerk of the Board, County Council, HSA, County Clerk, and CDI. The goal of these projects is to um, increase value and eliminate waste for staff and members of the community. Increasing value is focused on providing staff the opportunities to create more value, such as um, revisions to standard forms, creating new value process, and service development. While eliminating waste is really focused on streamlining to ensure that we're not wasting um, valuable time and resources doing unnecessary work. In addition to these projects, um, staff from Clerk of the Board, County, County Clerk, CDI, and personnel are actively employing process improvement tools at the division level. Um, I'd like to highlight the work that personnel has done uh, on that front, we worked with the personnel uh, classification team last year on several process improvement um, aspects for classifications. And since that work was completed, um, the, the classification team has continued and begun um, streamlining addi four additional processes. Uh, the team has created process maps, forms, and checklists to standardize these processes. And they broadcast these to everyone via an intranet site uh, to make everything easily accessible for county staff. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our current efforts are focused on Care Court and the CDI planning team. Our Care Court work originally focused on um, legal analysis and proceedings, but has evolved and shifted in the past month to standardizations as we get closer to Care Court the CARE Act implementation. Uh, we're currently working to create an interactive process map for our behavioral health teams uh, with all forms and legal references embedded so they can access everything they need to meet their CARE Act obligations on a single, uh, on a, in a single location. And uh, work with the planning department is currently focused on an original Primo Pi goal uh, from 2019 of creating a pre-clearance process for building permits based on spatial analysis and applicant goals. This work builds builds upon the, count, um, the planning department's current Camino guide, which is an informational tool that anyone can utilize to understand their residential building permit needs. And I'd like to pass it back to Nicole at this point. Sorry. 
Sorry there. Thank you, um, board. So with that, um, our recommendations are for you to accept in the file this update. And we have the four new mid-cycle mid objectives regarding the rail trail and health services staff development that we'd also like to, you to approve. And then we would return in January with our next update. And we're happy to answer any of your questions. Right, well, thank you very much for that update. And a lot of really great work that's going on. Um, so thank you all for your efforts. Um, with that, I'll open it up to the community to see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. If so, please approach the podium. You'll have two minutes. Seeing none here in chambers, go online and see if there's any member of the public online who'd like to speak to us on this item. We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for any questions, comments, action. And I'll start to my right with Supervisor Koenig. Well, just thank you for all the great work. Um, you know, what I appreciate about this effort is that we're we'll keeping an eye out for the um, you know, overall metrics um, and you know, the health of the community in uh, all forms, um, as well as the specific projects that are going to drive those results, uh, as we heard about today with Medi-Cal enrollment um, and uh, identification of recharge sites. So um, I think this is a really important overarching framework for moving the county's work forward. Thanks. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I just continue to be impressed by this. I'm so glad that this county took this action to, to get our plan, get get our vision uh, for, uh, get a vision for the general public to understand what we're going getting into. Uh, I, I say that in, in reference to the care court, for, for instance, coming up to be implemented. That's going to be a real test. It's going to be, it has been a challenge with what, seven or eight counties up to this point in the state. But now we're re we're going to have to be ready to go in the very near future. So I strongly encourage members of the public to read the report and learn more about the uh, the county's um, striving to fulfill its uh, its mission and vision. Um, it's really impressive. I'm uh, thank you, the county administrative office, and everybody that's been involved in this. Supervisor Hernandez. <laughs> Uh, really brief, I'll just uh, reiterate some of the things that uh, Supervisor Koenig and Supervisor McPherson said. Um, you know, I want to thank all the work that the CAO's office has done and HSA as well on this uh, on this uh, strategic um, operational plan. And I look forward to all the updates that are done in the future. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all again for your hard work on this and really big thanks to the 92% retention rate of um, MedCal beneficiaries. I think it's just is a testament to the effort that was put in to try to make sure that these people didn't fall through the cracks. And so it's really great that we're able to keep those people on their benefits. And, you know, um, with this being a, a strategic plan that was started in 2018 um, and that's kind of coming to an end, it'll be really great to see what those accomplishments have been. And, you know, we're going to have a, a completely new board as we look to our, you know, next strategic plan. And so my hope is that we can have a really um, good dialogue about, you know, what we want to see go in that plan. And I, because I think it's really going to help shape the efforts of this board and make sure that we're able to um, conduct business in a way that's um, streamlined and efficient and um, taking into account that who knows what unfunded mandates we might get from the state that'll kind of throw things through a loop or what disasters might hit us. But um, it'll at least provide us with the framework of how we can move things forward and um, look forward to working with you all on that. And so with that, I'll bring it back to the board for some of action on this item. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion by um, Supervisor Hernandez, and I'm gonna assume that that means to move the staff recommendations. Yes. Okay, and we have a second by Supervisor McPherson. And with that, I'll take a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously with Supervisor Friend recusing himself from the conversation. Okay, with that, that um, wraps up our regular session. And I'd just like to ask County Council if there's anything that we reported out from closed session today. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us today. And we'll see you all in September. Just the presentation, really.